Uh, welcome to the International Association for Reconciliation Studies. This is our second annual World Conference opened in Tokyo. Uh, because of, um, uh, I, I wonder if my face is appearing properly, but I will start. Uh, the International Association for Reconciliation Studies was established on August 10th, last year, 2020. ERU's International Association for Reconciliation Studies has united members from all five continents. Our mission is to convene activists, academics, and politicians from all segments of society, regardless of ethnicity, nationality, region, race, or gender, in order to support the advancement of reconciliation and peace. The COVID-19 situation has challenged the traditional conceptions of boundaries between nations that prevailed in the 20th century. The global pandemic joins and uh, amplifies other transnational issues, such as public health, ideas of, the ideas of democracy, justice, and even human emotions themselves. While physical proximity, proximity makes these issues relevant within nations, we must increasingly work internationally to address them. We hope that our collective approach to reconciliation studies will provide a basis for cooperative cultural and educational policy and global citizenships, which will in turn increase our ability to, act, to address global issues facing all of us today. Together with the unification through sports during the Tokyo Olympic Games 2020, this conference intends to foster global corporations around general issues of reconciliation. Now Tokyo is 7 o'clock PM in the evening and the east, east, and east coast of the United States is 6 o'clock AM in the very early morning. And uh, Germany is just 12 o'clock in the, in the afternoon. I guess uh, such an international association's trial is very challenging for all of us. I hope this uh, uh, international conference would be successful. So I want to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Martin Reina from uh, Iena University. Iena University is very famous for theology, and Martin Luther uh, ha had worked there. And I, when I once visited Iena University before corona situations, uh, Professor Reina has uh, kindly uh, take me around and uh, show me the very, uh, very spaceful floor, floors for many researchers all around the world. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome Reina as a president of, uh, of years. And uh, we are uh, going to have next year's meeting in East Coast in, in the United States. And the next year, maybe perhaps in, the, in, in Middle East or Africa or, or in, in Eastern Europe. And the next, next, next year is Western Europe. In that way, every four years, uh, we have annual conference, world annual conference. Uh, I hope this year's conference would uh, continue and uh, would work to let those scholars or uh, practitioners to join together and discuss the common global issues. Uh, so, Professor Martin. Uh, 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 please go ahead, it's, it's your turn. Yeah, you have 20 minutes. Yeah. A very warm welcome from myself to everybody on this conference. Can you give me a sign whether the sound is good? Thank you very much. Thank you also, Professor Asano, very much for his kind introduction and for hosting this conference. It's the second one. The first one was in Jena in Germany, and uh, the next one will be in the Washington area in the US. And uh, we are looking forward very much to have a continuous cooperation together, which I think is a very fruitful perspective. And this association 
will be built up more and more during this time we are working together. We are planning to have a scientific board in some months, which will also uh, put uh, into place a journal. It can be a scientific peer reviewed journal on reconciliation studies worldwide and will also publish the best contributions of our annual meetings. So we are very confident and very proud to have uh, already arrived at that state. There are very many people who made a lot of work to make this happen. Um, also from um, society, not from professors, but from assistants and people working with us, especially Benjamin Burstein, who is the secretary of the uh, association, and um, Mr. Huang Bin, who organized very much for this conference. Thank you very, very much. I know it was a intensive and great work you did, and thank you so much to make this happen and to um, do all this work uh, uh, as a benevolent pro bono, which is really a great gift for us all. So thank you so much. And I would uh, invite you, everybody. I think we have not the sign here to make a clapping uh, hand in the chat, but we can make it here for uh, Binyamin and Huang Bing for all the work they did and all the others, how they, how they prepared everything. Thank you very much. Now I would like to share the screen for uh, a bit a short presentation of the text I uh, wrote for this uh, conference. Uh, and uh, I hope this will, will work. And giving a kind of keynote speech as announced under the title, um, Researching Reconciliation in an Unreconciled World. <clears throat> Can you give me a short sign whether this is working? Thank you very much. So, no, does not move. So, welcome to Tokyo again, and thank you again, everybody, for being here with us. Thank you, Professor Asano, for uh, hosting us. We would have been invited to come to Tokyo normally, which would have been really exciting. And it's such a pity that we cannot join the Olympic Games and make something like a parallel event uh, for the Olympic Games of uh, reconciliation between us and be there. But thank you for offering this. And uh, thank you for joining also this um, online conference and taking your time to be with us uh, early in the morning or late in the evening. My presentation will take about uh, the question, is there a place for reconciliation in this world? And it will, this world is an unreconciled world with uh, increasing cleavages and frictions in societies increasing nationalism, increasing economic problems, ecologic problems. And uh, I want to say something where we stand and also where we are going, but all this very shortly. And uh, for the point where we are going with uh, our association, there's also uh, a proposition to have a kind of informal meeting uh, after the day to day's program. Um, for those who want to talk a bit about uh, questions you might have and wishes, we have to build up the scientific board. This would be one question to discuss. Also, there might be some information or discussions about uh, next year's conference and several other issues also about membership fees, which uh, um, can be soon also be um, uh, considered as uh, something which is for the common good, so tax-free according to some laws, and all these things I could uh, we could also be discuss about for those who want. This. So this is something which uh, we start directly after the day today was a proposition of Professor Asano, 
uh, in case we have still energy. If we are too tired, we make it tomorrow or something like this, but we try to have it today uh, after all this. So where we, we stay in reconciliation studies is there a place? This, the question seems merely rhetorical because of course, there are a lot of institutions researching reconciliation, a lot of universities teaching MA or PH deep programs on reconciliation. Addressed here a list, you find also many universities around the world, and it's even a complete, uh, it's on all continents, and there are all members, and there are also others. And there are also people teaching in departments of education, law, history, political science, of psychology, theology, and more on reconciliation and doing good research. And uh, so it's really a flourishing international uh, perspective and new collaborative research which is undertaken and which we see with the association more and more how big it is and how many people we find who are working on this in countries uh, quite far away from uh, the normal attention of many scholars living in the more Western uh, bubble of uh, science. But it's a new science and therefore we have to make the case for reconciliation studies still. We have not uh, really arrived as a state where we can say uh, everybody knows what it is and it's a good thing. It's not like uh, biochemistry or everybody says, okay, biochemistry is okay. Or uh, neuroscience, everybody uh, has established that this is a sense, uh, making sense. But we have um, to face in different uh, situations, different oppositions. And it's a typical, uh, a typical uh, kind of a staircase to, to walk up. It's first of all, it's uh, people say it's too new and strange. We do not accept it. Why is this reconciliation? What do, do they mean? Second state, they often say, and where are exactly the epistemological foundation? How do you define reconciliation? Uh, and what are the validity of the results? So we are challenged on this point. We have also, um, if this criticism is overcome, um, people say it might be not relevant for practice. It's idealistic or not functioning. And then a fourth point is, uh, as people will integrate and start already to integrate our results. And then they say, oh, it's uh, what we always did. It's nothing new, it's not so important. And I do not know which phase you, you encounter people in your context, but uh, I meet them on all the four stages in, in the German context. And uh, I uh, would like to give you some um, some ideas from my side on this. So the first would be a, a kind of emotional rejection, uh, which is normal. Everything new and challenging people first uh, are not liking so much. And we uh, um, must be aware that we need to convince, to be humble, to convince. Uh, we want to open a new field of research. We want to change the world into a more peaceful world. So we have also some normative games to play and some ideas we want to um, realize that we want to make an impact in the world. We want this, this world become more peaceful, more respectful, more understanding and more just through the way of reconciliation. And I think this is a strong motivation, especially for me to do this research. And, uh, and this we can also show and say, we, we need to have this. And the second uh, thing, the attack, we don't know what we are doing. The basic concepts are unclear. I think we already made huge um, progress in this field because uh, reconciliation is not just an internal state of mind or a religious concept of forgiving or of uh, the kingdom of God or it's not an, an ideal goal, but it's a clear definition that it's the establishment of better relations after grave incidents, such as war, civil wars, genocides, massacres, forced displacement, colonialism, 
apartheid and similar burden of the past people have to face. And this is, is clearly about re relationships and to make them better. And even small parts and small steps can be considered already as a step towards reconciliation. And it's between individuals, groups, organizations, states, environment, transcendence. People have to reconcile in different relationships. And it seems also quite a generally accepted um, results that it's a multifaceted process, reconciliation with many elements, from education to law, from, from aspects of politics and diplomacy to uh, art and culture and uh, economy. This all is uh, influencing reconciliation processes and it normally after really grave incidents, it takes several generations about 100 years at least, and it's a, a long-term pro project. So it's not a, a finite game in a small uh, five years term like many people and also administrations play, but it's a long-term, it's an infinite game beyond our lifetime. But all our games normally in our life uh, is beyond our lifetime and it's to work for beyond this lifetime we have to to um, behave and to work and to adjust our activities so this seems to me clear and then also when people ask how you measure this so it's relatively widely accepted that we measure reconciliation uh, by a subjective approach that people uh, you ask the people in the conflict whether they think the relationships have become better or uh, even good or the same as they were before or the same as they have with other people and you find positive emotions such as sympathy, forgiveness, trust, respect, love towards the others and then um, it's um, reconciliation. There are problems because there are groups often and who speaks for the group or nature and transcendence or this other part of the conflict is that and therefore we need sometimes representation that people are able to speak for the group in the name of the state or of, for people who died and uh, or even for transcendence and God. Uh, but this representation needs acknowledgement. It must be accepted if it's happening. Uh, and then things normally can, can function and go ahead. And we need also objective data as well to uh, measure reconciliation. Um, so for example, if there are positive contacts in everyday life, cooperation, mutual help, intermarriage, positive reactions on Facebook and other social media, or they defend the other part against attacks or so kind of caring behavior. So this we can see and observe and so we can measure reconciliation. So this is a very um, empirical research we can also do on reconciliation and uh, uh, I think there is no reason to have any criticism about this point. Uh, the methods are also clear how to, to find out, like semi-structured interviews for the subjective side, is often not digital data analysis for the objective and subjective side. All these things are, are relatively well established. And um, for the results, of course, we need high quality research on reconciliation. This I always uh, trying to underline because if you do something new and you need to be better also in quality than those who do already the same business like always. And we have many PhD students who are doing this work. And also in this group, we have many researchers and uh, research institutes who do uh, very high quality research and I'm very, happy that this will um, become bigger and bigger. And it's also an unjust uh, situation. We have a short history of uh, reconciliation studies. It begins in the 90s and reconciliation is a long-term process. So uh, we have uh, not even 
deemed possible to address several questions and some reconciliation processes might be in a crisis, but this will not say that they are failures. They can uh, restart again very well. And so much was invested in also in other studies, which are sometimes competing like security studies or the development of, uh, of uh, uh, weapons uh, in the world. And uh, what has have state programs invested in reconciliation studies? Not much so far. So we have really uh, also competing disciplines. I think I will skip this point because I was asked to be, be, be short, but I try and you will be able to read it to answer a bit on how we could relate to security studies, to conflict resolution, to uh, transitional justice um, and uh, conflict transformation, which at my view is very close to reconciliation approach and peace studies. Um, and uh, um, at the end, I think we have a, a, a clear approach and a clear space in the scientific world. And we can uh, rather feel strong. And we are uh, people of the future, people who are giving hope to, to the situation, how to overcome the um, difficulties. We are at least um, uh, in a better situation than we have now the second conference. Uh, of the IARS, but we have also the Olympic Games in Tokyo. And there were also the second Olympic Games, and I read a bit about this, they were in Paris, and uh, uh, it, they were together with the World Exhibition, and they were considered as a disturbing annex, and uh, not many spectators and public attention took place. Uh, but what also was there, there were some people as athletes taking part, and they did not even know that they were taking part in the Olympic Games. Even during a whole lifetime, they did not realize that they were, this competition was part of the Olympic Games. There was also no gold medal, but only silver. Uh, and so it was really uh, much worse than uh, this conference can ever be that we will have to this time. Here is our second conference, and look how the Olympic Games became big and important with the years. We have um, now many academics, MA and PhD, but often the connection between the different researchers and the boundaries of countries and even more of disciplines uh, are uh, a problem to connect and to integrate their knowledge and to build really reconciliation studies up as it should be. And therefore the, the IARS is so important. In Corona times, it, it's making harder to meet and to know about each other. And uh, this Corona time is a uh, kind of uh, closing borders and uh, isolation. It uh, can also foster nationalistic tendencies, um, even in research as well if money is lacking for traveling and all these things. So we want to make the next steps, the journal, scientific board, the next year's conference, regional groups we want to build up, and also other topics we will discuss in the informal meeting. And I think reconciliation studies are more needed than, than ever. The societies are deeply divided. And there is something strange happening that majorities are fighting minorities much more than it was in the last decades. Majorities feel threatened by refugees, by minorities, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, indigenous uh, people, and they are more and more um, oppressed. And there is a, a race of nationalism less cooperation, international cooperation organization under pressure, a remilitarization even uh, of uh, police is taking place in many countries. And there is also a, a lot of uh, a concept of the surveillance and security, which is, has become a big business and which many people think they make uh, reconciliation uh, 
not any more necessary. If you have uh, enough people to protect you, enough weapon, you do not need to reconcile with your neighbor. And the ecological crisis also. And I think we, it's really important. We have also some new topics we have to, uh, to work on. This is already my third and last point. Um, this giving back of objects for museums from Africa is now a big topic worldwide. And I, I could talk with one of the main actors in this field, Benedict Savoy, who, is, uh, who wrote a, a report to President Macron of giving back. And, and she said reconciliation could be the perspective under which we will, I would like to see our work. So that it could be a reconciling um, approach on this uh, restitution. We have to build reconciliation in the middle of a mixed situation of imperfect peace, which uh, was always like this, but it uh, was much more now uh, put into the focus by situations like in Colombia, where there is some peace, and there are some peace treaties, there are some actors of the international, national, local, level administration and civil societies who are acting for reconciliation strongly and others who are partly acting against it. And this is a, a quite common situation, but it's these new theories of conflict and reconciliation. There's not just one actor for and the other against. It's not just top down, bottom up. It's a mixed situation, which is interesting and uh, to discover and to describe. Then we have more to do, at least in what we are doing in Jena, with the concept of democracy and reconciliation. There can be concept of democracy which are not reconciling at all, which are just the rule of majorities uh, over the minorities. And, um, and then there can be a concept of democracy which can help very much for reconciliation. And I think this is a debate we uh, are just beginning. Another point, it's uh, gender studies and women and LGBTI plus activism and reconciliation. Um, during a long time, those studies were more considered by transitional justice studies and they were uh, considered as uh, victims of the conflict. Women as victims of the conflict, uh, for example, of rape on the Balkans and crimes and uh, but they are also activists. They have made marches for peace. They have, they were the mothers of the Plaza del Mayo in Argentina. There's a lot of activism in Kurdistan and everywhere around the world. And, uh, and how they see their activism? Is it for another form of justice? Is it for reconciliation? Uh, this is at least also a new question to bring these discussions together, reconciliation studies and gender studies. There are already some works done on it, but there is still, because it's everywhere almost around the world happening, a lot to be done. Art and reconciliation is a, an interesting topic. Many uh, people in art are very activists. And there are a lot of other things to discover. And I thank you very much for your time and your attention. Wish you a good conference. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. Uh, no, reconciliation is continuing beyond our lifetimes. And like the Tokyo Olympic Games is, uh, Olympic Games itself has continued over 100 years in the same way. I hope reconciliation studies also continue as a channeling field for many academic fields, as Professor Martin said. I am very sorry to introduce Martin's specialty. Martin is a German Protestant theologian. He holds a chair in systematic theology, ethics, at the University of Vienna, uh, Friedrich Schiller University, Vienna, Germany. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. So next, uh, 
I wanna introduce uh, our comrade and liaison scholars. Um, the first scholar is Professor Karina Kolostrina from George Mason University in the United States. Karina is a professor Social uh, professor of social psychologist whose work focuses on social identity and identity based conflict intergroup, intergroup, and uh, also she's interested in nation building process. She once visited Wasser University as a visitor and she did research bilateral relationship with Japan. She will be a next administrator of the third annual conference. It's your turn. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tayumi, for introducing me. And Martin, thank you for very interesting and inspiring uh, vision for reconciliation studies. Indeed, this um, society, which uh, association, international association, we are which we organize together, its main idea is really make reconciliation studies strong academic fields. And uh, that's why our conferences are very important for us when we bring together, expire ideas and develop new ways how to explore scientifically academic perspective, but also how to work with practitioners and help to reflect on the practices as Martin told, it's very young field and a lot of processes of reconciliation are still ongoing. So it's very hard to explore something which is still in process, exactly have some uh, crisis moments and other moments, but this is what makes this field is very exciting uh, and interesting for research. And um, I represent the Carter School for Peace uh, and Conflict Resolution, which is the oldest uh, school in the field in the world. We are 40 years old, celebrating 40 years old this year. And we have all level of students. We have undergrad students, uh, master students in PhD program, very strong PhD program. And I'm very pleased that a lot of our PhD students taken uh, part of this conference as presenters and as uh, discussants. And I also lead the lab, Peace Lab on Reconciling Conflicts in Intergroup Division. Peace Labs is a new development in our school, which brings together students and professors in completely equal space of collaboration and give opportunity for everyone to thrive and give opportunity for people to work on innovative ideas. We run workshops, we run pilot research, apply for projects, and currently we have four ongoing projects um, in uh, multiple countries, including Serbia, Ukraine, Sudan, and uh, uh, United States. We're working with um, Native American uh, representatives. And I am really pleased to announce that next year our Peace Lab and our Carter School will be hosting a conference in Washington, D.C. We will have dates more specifically, but most likely, as we discuss, it will be beginning of um, August. Similarly, as we run our first conference and second conference, and we hope to have this constantly every year at the same time and for our conferences ahead. And we really hope that uh, we can host majority of people who come in person. It's a wonderful time. And we have beautiful facility just outside of Washington DC on a, on a beautiful water. And this will be a, it's a retreat and it will be wonderful for all of us come together and stay there for conference, but also for just walks around the water for reflection. And I'm looking forward to this. Again, thank you, Tayomi. Thank you, everyone, for organizing Benjamin one, so for organizing this conference. Thank you, Karina. And uh, we have uh, eight liaison scholars who are very interested in our International Association for Reconciliation Studies. Uh, 
we are very honored to invite such a very distinguished and honorable, honorable scholars in every field and all around from all around the world. The first liaison scholar is Professor Son Yul from South Korea. He is a president of the East Asian Institute and also he's a director of the Center for International Studies in Yonsei University. He majors in Japanese politics and foreign policy, and also he is a specialist of international, international political economy. So, Professor Sang Yul, it's your turn. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I am Yol Son, uh, president of EAI East Asia Institute and professor at Yonsei University. Uh, on behalf of uh, East Asia Institute, I'd like to congratulate uh, International Association for uh, Reconciliation Studies and Waseda University's Center for International Reconciliation for holding this very important conference. I am honored and pleased to be part of this very, uh, to this event. Um, I don't, uh, as a person, squarely, I don't squarely work on reconciliation, um, but this study means a lot to my uh, affiliation institu uh, institutions activities. Uh, EAI is a private nonpartisan think tank located in, in Seoul, Korea. Uh, its work focuses mainly on international relations and uh, foreign policy issues and carry out uh, research um, and policy recommendations, uh, as well as practical education of the informed uh, public. Um, I think reconciliation studies is important for uh, EAI in, in, in three ways. Uh, first, um, EAI's major research projects include uh, US-China rivalry issues uh, and recasting uh, inter-Korean relations, uh, reconstruction of Korea-Japan relations, um, and democratic uh, democracy cooperation in e Asia, among others. And at least three areas are related to this reconciliation studies. First, um, as you know, that um, Japan and Korea entered the worst diplomatic relationships uh, since the diplomatic uh, normalization of 1965. The core issue is obviously, you know, coming to term with the modern history, history of colonialism and war uh, between the two governments and society. Uh, historical reconciliation is what is really needed for a meaningful restart of the future-oriented cooperation between the two. Uh, in that regard, uh, EAI is currently conducting uh, a core research uh, with Japanese scholars, some of uh, uh, whom are, are present uh, today in this, uh, um, in this Zoom. Um, and uh, so uh, that's one. And, uh, uh, and second uh, is uh, for uh, Koreans, uh, you know, reconciliation between the North and South uh, is obviously a significant, significant event and task uh, to, to resolve. And uh, it is not just uh, the issue of, you know, uh, dealing with uh, nuclear weapons, um, you know, military, you know, threats and others, but also uh, it is about uh, reconciliations in terms of identity between um, increasingly departing, uh, you know, two people um, uh, in, in the peninsula. So uh, that's uh, another issue. And three is uh, obviously uh, we see that, uh, you know, there's an increasing, um, you know, competition uh, between United States and China. And here we see a mutual suspicion uh, between the two exacerbates uh, security dilemmas and creates spirals of tensions. Uh, we see that in, in inter-Korean relations. And also we see that in the case of Japan-China relationship and here alarmingly uh, US-China relationships as well that are increasingly shaped by the clash of identities. Uh, 
you know, as well as a clash of uh, interest, material interest between the two. Um, so, uh, you know, this, uh, all three issues uh, involve uh, reconciliation issues and uh, really, really uh, need to benefit from uh, reconciliation studies here in this conference. Um, so I believe uh, that reconciliation studies uh, deserve mention uh, and attention, not only for academic study, but also for uh, practical policy. Uh, I have utmost confidence in Waseda University, um, you know, Professor Asano and this uh, international organizations uh, for venturing and advancing crucial, this very crucial subjects. And I reassure that EAI is honored and pleased to be part of this broadly, uh, you know, conceived uh, academic coalition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Song Yol. I appreciate a lot. And I'm, I'm look, very looking forward to processing the future cooperation with you. Thank you so much. So next presenter is Professor Atsuko Kawakita in Tokyo University. She is a director of the Center for German and European Studies. It's called DESK. And uh, she, is, uh, she is measuring German history. Particularly, she, her math PhD thesis is about uh, Germany's repatriations from Eastern Europe. So, Professor Kawakita, it's your turn. Uh, Professor Asano, thank you very much for your kindly introducing me. Uh, my name is Kawakita. It is my great honor and pleasure to have the opportunity to speak a few words to celebrate the second conference of the International Association for Reconciliation Studies, IARS. This 2021 conference in Tokyo is being held one year after its memorable inception in 2020 in Vienna, in which I participated online. I am a historian and the director of the Center for German and European Studies at the University of Tokyo. So please let me take the opportunity uh, to introduce our center in brief. The Center for German and European Studies at the University of Tokyo was established in 2000 to promote interdisciplinary research and education in the field of German and European Studies. The center is supported by the German Academic Exchange Service as DAAD one of the most important actors in German cultural diplomacy and the world's largest funding organization for the international exchange of students and researchers. Currently, there are 20 research centers that are supported by DAAD worldwide. Our center happens to be the first one established in East Asia. As such, we function as an active hub in the worldwide network of international research collaboration on German and European studies. One of the most important topics that our center's research activities focus on is the consideration of issues related to history and reconciliation. Since its, since its establishment, the center has organized many symposiums, student seminars, and other events to facilitate discussion and contemplation about the history, memory, and coexistence of countries in the world, especially in Europe as our research subject and East Asia as our site location. Of our current research projects, we have two projects that are related to issue reconciliation. And in the framework of those two research projects and in close cooperation with the sister DAAD centers in Pekin and Seoul, we will be, for example, organizing a conference focusing on memory and reconstruction by the fall of 2021. The Germany has been long promoting historical dialogue with its neighbors, and at the same time is interested in promoting historical dialogue in other areas in the world, including Asia Pacific region. In the framework of the cooperation of DAAD centers in East Asia, we would like to continue our efforts to discuss complicated and subtle issue in an academic and calm manner. We are convinced that 
the constant communication and dialogues would lead to better understanding and improve relationships between conflicting nations and groups. Following the end of World War II, to think about the modern history of one's own country has been a major issue of dispute for a long time in Japan. It seems like it is a well-established international fact that Japan is reluctant to face its negative past. This is often said, especially when drawing a comparison with Germany. However, the number of people who are interested in critically engaging with the past as well as reconciliation and coexistence in the region is not small in Japan. Since we are aware of the fact that Japan has a negative national history, the more we are interested in engaging with the issue of peace and reconciliation in Asia and the world. Therefore, I deeply appreciate the decision of Professor Asano to host the second conference of the IARS in Tokyo, which has given us the chance to show to the international academic community that we in Japan are also interested in reconciliation and look forward to see its realization. I hope that this conference will be a cornerstone for further development in IARS and our possible cooperation in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kawakita. And uh, we are very honored to welcome you because you are Center of German Studies in Asia, three centers, um, one of the three centers among Asia. And uh, in order to process a comparison between Asian and European case, uh, uh, the desk's mission is very great. I appreciate a lot. So next presenter is Professor uh, Nam Gijon from Seoul National University. Um, he is a, I'm sorry. He's a professor of Institute for Japanese Studies in Seoul National University. And uh, he is uh, uh, now researching peace for both Koreans and Japanese civil society. And he's also interested in Russia-Japan relationships. He once studied in Komaba campus of Tokyo University where uh, the desk also exists and where I also studied my PhD course. So, Professor Nam Gijon, it's your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pro uh, Professor Asano, for inviting me. Uh, and congratulations on the second international conference of IARS. And I'm very happy to introduce my institute to you today. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm working at the Institute for Japanese Studies of Seoul National University. And my major is uh, post-war Japanese politics and foreign relations. Of course, uh, the Korea-Japan relations is also an important research theme for me. Uh, let me uh, briefly introduce IJS uh, using PowerPoint slide. Uh, the current, uh, as the current director of IJS is Professor Kim Hyun-chul. Uh, he is the staff of the Graduate School of International Studies at SNU, and he is an economist. And uh, the, the Institute has uh, six full-time professors, including me, and the two research professors working together. And uh, each of them uh, is studying Japan against their own discipline background. Uh, they are researchers of Japanese literature, anthropology, history, uh, thought history, art history, political science, and international relations. Uh, IJS opened in 2004. Uh, it was reported as a news article at the time. Uh, this is because uh, it was uh, a big event itself that uh, caused the social uh, repercussions in Korea. 
uh, in the background, uh, there is a history uh, of special relationship between Korea and Japan, you know. And uh, the history with Japan, which was uh, an EPI in Korea, has long influenced education and research related to Japan. Um, in Korea, Japan was either a past to overcome or a model to follow. And uh, these two were incompatible, I think. Uh, therefore, uh, the interest in Japan uh, had been sloped to the excess of nationalism on the one hand, and on the other, uh, it had uh, become uh, just model studies, uh, which are very uh, historical. And uh, in the 1990s, the era of globalization began after the post-Cold War. And, and the importance of area studies began to be emphasized in Korea. Uh, as a result, the need for objective uh, and the scientific study uh, about Japan was emphasized too. Uh, in this reality, uh, Seoul National University began to pr promote Japanese studies, uh, which led to the opening of IJS in 2004. Uh, since then, Japanese studies by IJS have been developed, uh, conscious of the struggling um, relationship between Korea and Japan, and the shaky feelings of Koreans toward Japan. The understanding Japan objectively and scientifically uh, is uh, considered a very important task in understanding South Korea itself. I mean, ourselves and designing uh, the future of Korea. Now, IJS is conducting researches and academic uh, projects to meet these challenges and uh, is conducting many social contribution activities. The most important project is HK Joint Research. Uh, HK means Korean uh, Humanities uh, Korea. And uh, under this project, we are conducting researches on the subject of the uh, Japanese life world. Uh, IJS also supports networking of domestic Japanese researchers and among the researchers from all over the world. In, in addition to the Korea Research Foundation, uh, IJS is uh, supported by various institutions such as uh, Japan Foundation and Korea Foundation and, and Panjong Foundation and Toshiba Foundation too. Um, uh, these are the uh, some uh, activities of uh, IJS. And uh, as a publication, we regularly uh, publish English journals and Korean journals and publish the, uh, the uh, achievement of the aforementioned HK projects. Uh, we are also publishing the, the reading, reading Japan series to help the, the general public understand Japan. And we uh, also uh, strive to foster next generation researchers and educate young people and provide lectures to teachers who teach Japanese in high schools and, and local residents who want systematic information or knowledges about Japan. And uh, in addition, uh, with the support of the Korea Foundation, uh, we plan and operate a future dialogue of uh, 100 citizens uh, from Korea and Japan, uh, helping communications and uh, mutual understanding of the general public of Korea and Japan. The uh, historical conversation that our institute has been conducting this year is also part of it. Recently, comfort women issue uh, exacerbated Korea-Japan relations seriously. In order to solve this problem, I think we need a consensus on the solution in Korea first. 
uh, in response to uh, the, the need, uh, the IJS is pushing for social dialogue among relevant researchers and activists in Korea. Uh, in Korea, uh, Japanese studies itself is uh, uh, an effort to overcome the unhappy history, unhappy history between uh, Korea and Japan. Uh, in, in, in that sense, uh, it is also a way of trying to reconcile between Korea and Japan. Uh, on this basis, I, I hope that IJS will contribute in organizing international network of uh, reconciliation studies, uh, hosting uh, the international conference of IARS someday. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nam. I really hope you, uh, your okay. institute will support the IARS four years later. Uh, it's a very beautiful, thank you for your very beautiful slide. And I guess uh, uh, Korea is the most preferable place for Japan studies, uh, much more than uh, Japanese ourselves. Uh, maybe the Korean scholars, uh, scholars centers, Japan, in Japan studies will be the center of worldwide Japan studies, including United States Japanese studies or European Japanese studies. So next presenter is Pro Professor Jimmy Su from Taiwan. Professor Su is a associate uh, pro research professor in Academica Sinica in Taiwan. He is an Institute of Jurisprudence in Academica Sinica. He received his degree from National Taiwan University and also National Chen Chenchi University. And also he graduated from University of Chicago and law school. His research interests include legal philosophy, constitutional theory, comparative constitutional law. Uh, once I was invited to Taiwan, uh, I very welcome Professor Su as our new liaison scholars. So Professor Su, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Asano. Um, I thank you especially because it is through you that we are now connected with IRS. And uh, I also want to congratulate IRS uh, for this second uh, annual meeting, and we look for uh, future meetings uh, uh, to participate in uh, in this community. So I, I'm just uh, I will just give you uh, an idea of what we uh, who we are and uh, in Taiwan uh, as a research group, and also uh, give you the 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 context and of uh, political reconciliation uh, in Taiwan. So since uh, 2019, I have organized a group of interdisciplinary scholars to work on a project on the ethics of historical memory. Uh, in this project, we hope to pioneer reconciliation studies in Taiwan. Uh, to say political uh, reconciliation in Taiwan, we mean, first of all, uh, the, the reconciliation between the two main political camps. Uh, on the one hand, we have the, the, the blue camp, which uh, represent is um, the ideology that is more in continuity or certain level of discontinuity from the authoritarian past. Uh, those mainlanders who came to Taiwan uh, after the war and those who are um, native Taiwan, Taiwanese who represent a more a pro independence ideology. Our collaborative project is uh, funded by my institute. It's uh, a quite humble beginning. We do not have a research center particularly devoted uh, to reconciliation studies yet. We come from law, sociology, political science, philosophy, and history. But one thing that do uh, unite us is that we all take transitional justice seriously and reconciliation seriously. Well, uh, that may sound uh, just uh, normal to you, but um, I would say that we're, uh, it's not because it makes us uh, a bit of like, we feel like outliers in contemporary Taiwan's uh, public square, which is severely polarized and quite vengeful if you're familiar with, especially the transitional uh, uh, justice public discourse in Taiwan. So, um, so now let me give you just uh, why we're so concerned about uh, what we're 
being concerning right now. Uh, so as you all know, that Taiwan bears the brunt of China's sharp power. Whether Taiwan as the precious first Chinese democracy will survive the, the, the new Cold War depends to a large degree upon how Taiwan's opposing political camps will form a united front to defend uh, our common democratic values and uh, give our leaders sufficient degree of political trust to maneuver through a very troubled water ahead. Arguably, the maneuver will have to involve a firm stand on liberal uh, democratic values while cautiously avoiding total alienation or antagonization of China by uh, severing our cultural and historical ties uh, to China. But without political reconciliation, this goal would be very hard to achieve. Uh, there, are serious, uh, there are serious difficulties. So on the one hand, um, Taiwan society harbors two conflicting paradigms of historical memories. Collective memory of the past is an essential part of national identity. However, the national identity conflict uh, between the two, two groups uh, is very inflammable, precisely because their memories are structured by conflicting meta-narratives. One, narr one, uh, one narrative narrates of memory centering on two Sino uh, Japanese wars, and the other remembers Taiwan as an orphan of Asia that are exploited by neighboring powers and are victims of colonization, including uh, Japanese and Chinese settlers. So one's hero is another's villain. On the other hand, even as long-term opinion polls show a steady rise of ta uh, Taiwanese national identity, especially among young people, the type of rising Taiwanese identity as shown in the Sunflower Movement demonstrate a new national identity intensely antagonistic to Chinese elements. So both the cleavage and the development of Taiwanese nationalism uh, leave Taiwanese leaders very little room for cross-strait maneuvers and it aggravates domestic political strife. But transitional justice is one of the major battleground, battleground of this political strife. And in contemporary Taiwan issues involving the formation of collective historical memories, such as historic textbook guidelines and historical memorials or statutes are typically framed under discussion of transitional, transitional justice. And many people, especially those who wanna remove any trace of authoritarian legacy and cut off Chinese ties regard instant removal as the imperative out of justice. In recent years, we see repeated instances of vandalism from both camps uh, against the statues, which they consider as symbolism of oppression, despite being cherished by the other side. So the vandalism signals resentment and vindictiveness between the opposing camps. Now, I offer some ideas that have uh, struck, uh, struck us as a group uh, as important uh, in our research. So first, Geopolitics and democratic development constitute important settings in which the idea of reconciliation has to be embedded. And intricate analysis of the settings is, is very important for us to grasp a need or even urgency of reconciliation. It means reconciliation, whether and how far uh, uh, to go should be highly context sensitive um, despite its deontological nature. Second, transitional justice and historical memory formation involve two distinct yet related fields of policy concerns. Transitional justice necess necessarily centers on victims and victimizers and the negative part of the uh, uh, collective memory. Uh, however, historical memory in should involve all the lived experience of people on this land and could involve both negative and positive side of it, uh, history. So building historical memory should be a common dialogical enterprise rather than uh, initiatives monopoli monopolized by those who consider themselves as victims. Third, for some people, reconciliation requires forgetting. For others, reconciliation demands uh, remembering. Both make sense under certain circumstances, but how to reconcile different visions of uh, reconciliation? We should continue to work on theorization uh, of this concept. And we have also realized that reconciliation appears quite shallow and pale um, it, against a certain cultural background. So for example, there is important Chinese liter uh, literature written in Chinese 
on the moral imperative in ancient China of avenging the death of one's father uh, or brothers. It's very prominent in uh, Confucian traditions. It's also reflected in ancient Chinese legal systems. So Confucian tradition in ancient China glorifies vengeance for one's elderly relatives. So how do we find intellectual or even spiritual resources in our culture and history? And lastly, um, the role of history as uh, a discipline is significant. Should history as a uh, discipline be oriented by substantive values, uh, such as reconciliation, or should it be a, just a neutral, par, uh, impartial discipline, uh, uh, just uh, coming up with a critical historiography? Um, in Taiwan, uh, interestingly, the discipline of Taiwan history is inextricably bound up with the rise of Taiwanese nationalism. Should it con continue to be so? Should reconciliation be a value orienting um, uh, historical studies? Um, so there are more to be said, and I, uh, I can see that in the future, we'll have a lot to exchange. But in the future, we hope to take our project to the regional and international level and contribute to reconciliation studies in general. And we will be more than glad to contribute to IRS community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Su. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. For Taiwan, reconciliation is a very urgent issue. I come to know. And uh, in the process of serializations, I want to join you and I want to collaborate with you. Thank you so much. Next presenter is Professor Naoyuki Memori. He is a uh, director of uh, Waseda Research Institute of Taiwan. And he is a faculty of uh, political science and econ economics department in Waseda University. And he's a comrade uh, of me. And uh, he, he graduated from Waseda University and also University of Chicago, taking PhD in University of Chicago. Umemori's specialty is history of modern Japanese political thought, and his research interests include social theory, nationalism, colonialism, and Asianism. So, it's, uh, Professor Umemori, it's your turn. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for a uh, kind introduction, uh, Toyomi. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Naoyuki Memori. I have been working very closely with Professor Asano for the establishment of reconciliation studies in Japan. And I have also been serving as the director of Waseda Research Institute of Taiwan. I'm very honored to have an opportunity to introduce our institute to distinguished participants. Our institute, was established in 2003 with the support of the Taiwanese government. Since then, we have been organizing many research projects as well as educational projects on Taiwan. In cooperation with scholars at home and abroad, <clears throat> we hold workshops, host conferences, publish books, and offer Taiwan studies as a minor program for undergraduate students at Waseda University. I'm extremely happy to be a part of the International Association of Reconciliation Studies as the director of Research Institute of Taiwan. After the democratization, the people of Taiwan have achieved historic uh, reconciliation, the most important task for their society. How to develop the recognition of the dignity of individuals by redressing and acknowledging the violations made under the previous authoritarian regime? How to advance the cause of reconciliation by respective indigenous people's culture, way of life, their rights to traditional lands. These are the examples of the issues with which Taiwanese people have been tackling in the process of democratization. The concept of transitional justice has widely discussed concerning 
its own history. This is extremely instructive from the point of view of the Japanese. Here in Japan, people rarely reflect on their own history through the lens of transitional justice. Certainly, Japan experienced the transition from authoritarian regime to democracy in 1945. But almost no attempt has been made to redress the violation of human rights committed by military regime before 1945 in this society. The absence of transitional justice in Japanese history is one of the main reasons Japan cannot advance historical reconciliation with its East Asia neighbors. I have always been encouraged and empowered by the effort of the Taiwanese people to confront the difficult past. I believe Taiwanese experiences will make a significant contributions to the development of reconciliation studies worldwide. Our institute would like to help make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mary. I'm also a member of the Research Institute of Taiwan in Waseda. Transitional justice is a very important concept to think about our uh, national society. Nation state system itself has been installed in East Asia within 100 to 150 years. And uh, nation building is supported by the historical memory, and it's now being contested very seriously. Uh, uh, maybe the linkage of Taiwan studies and uh, Japanese studies and Korean studies, such as regional studies in each area should be linked under the big framework of reconciliation studies, which embrace emotional value studies or memory studies, I hope. So next presenter is Professor uh, Atsushi Ishida. He is a... Uh, uh, professor in Graduate School of Arts and Science, College of Arts and uh, Science in University of Tokyo. And he is the 19th president of the Japan Peace Society, which has been established in 1970s, I, I guess. And uh, Professor Ishida is measuring international relations theory and also international order and diplomacy and uh, human security or rational choice theory or game theory. Professor Ishida, it's your turn. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for Professor Asano. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to be a part of this 2021 IARS conference. And it is my true privilege uh, to share my high expectation for reconciliation studies with my colleagues all over the world. Since I'm speaking on behalf of Peace Studies Association of Japan, let me first give you a brief description, brief description uh, about peace studies in Japan and then my thoughts on the important nexus between peace and reconciliation. By doing so, I'd like to show my great respect for your commitment to figuring out how we can reconcile our conflicting viewpoints or visions that vary across groups and over time. First, peace research in Japan. My field of expertise is international relations, which is a subfield of political science. Like peace research elsewhere, peace research in Japan is interdisciplinary as well, including nuclear physics for an obvious historical reason, modern history, constitutional and international law, international relations, developmental economic sociology area studies, cultural studies, environmental science, and so forth. I have no intention to claim that this is an exhaustive list of related subdisciplines. Uh, sub the association was founded in 1973, originally concerned primarily about the causes of war as well as conditions of peace. The Peace Studies Association has broadened the scope of 
peace research by redefining its foundational concept of peace from absence of large scale armed conflict uh, to more broadly defined peace, such as respect for human dignity. As I mentioned earlier, the rest of my talk will be my own thoughts on the nexus between peace and reconciliation. From the perspective of, re uh, from the perspective of peace research, reconciliation is indispensable uh, for peaceful coexistence or negotiated peace. Reconciliation uh, can be restated as mutually negotiated peace as opposed to unilaterally imposed peace. It is widely recognized that regime transition is often accompanied by post-transition justice or pre-transition injustice. One can categorize uh, negotiated peace according to the transitional, uh, sorry, according to the jurisdictional scope of this transitional justice. I have two types of transitional justice in mind, that is national transitional justice and international transitional justice. Let me do some thought experiments by telling you a stylized uh, hypothetical story. Suppose that, suppose that here's a country which, is, which in the past waged a war. Victims of this war included not only combatants, combatants but also non-combatants, and the victims were not limited to post-war citizens, but also include post-war aliens, such as those in its colonized territories. If the state redresses only the war-related loss incurred by its own national combatants in the wake of war without paying reasonable attention to the war-related loss incurred by all the others, this would certainly generate the, generate the dispute of national transitional justice within the territorial boundary of the state. This is indeed a serious problem, but the story should not end here. This national transitional justice dispute particularly if unresolved, um, would reduce the perceived importance of international transitional justice issue in the mind of the broad public. The public would be more, more reasonably sorry that the war-related loss incurred by the post-war aliens would not be adequately redressed unless that incurred by the post-war citizens, mostly non-combatants, were redressed even in such a state of national emergency. This way, national and international transitional justice could be related to each other. This post, uh, this post war redress of war related loss would be a heavy burden on the national treasury, but this added cost of the post war redress, if committed, be, if committed beforehand, would make truly credible the announced intention of the state not to resort force abroad unless attacked. This is a logic of costly signaling of peaceful intentions in the future by means of the redress of war-related loss in the past. This is just one way of logically bridging peaceful coexistence with historical reconciliation. I'm sure that peace researchers would learn a lot from reconciliation studies. I look forward to collaborate with interested with interested colleagues in finding a way out of violence and injustice in the world. Thank you very much for your attention and listening. Thank you, Professor Ishida. Thank you so much. How big influence war impacted to Japanese national memory. And uh, in 1970s, there is a redress from Thomas uh, uh, which is uh, intertwining uh, national address and international address. Thank you so much. Such an uh, impact of war or colonizations uh, must be researched in the framework of reconciliation studies. So next presenter is Professor Wei Tin Yang from Taiwan. He, she is a uh, she is taking PhD in East Asian Studies in the University of, of Denver in the United States. And uh, he is a post-colonial research fellow in Institute of International Relations in National Chen, uh, Chenchi University in Taiwan. So, Professor Wei Yang, it's your time. Uh, first, I would like to thank, thank you, Professor Osano, 
and the Center of International Reconciliation Study at Waseda University to invite me and give me this chance to participate in this wonderful conference. My name is Florence Young, or you can call me Wenting Young. Now I serve as assistant professor at the program in Japan study at Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. My research includes uh, Sino-Japanese relations and also China's uh, nationalism and Japanese foreign policy and China's economic statecraft. Um, then I will, I will take this opportunity to introduce my program, our program. The program in Japan studies is the first graduate program engaged in Japan study among all of the national university in Taiwan. This program is not only the first program specialized in Japan study in social science disciplines, but also the only one in Japan study which offered the PhD degree program in Taiwan. In the past, most of the Japan study in Taiwan put emphasis on Japanese language and literature. Study on Japanese social science were often neglected. In view of this, with the system of inter interchange association and the Japan Foundation, National Zhengzhou University established the program in Japan study under the College of International Affairs in 2011. Our program has three features. The first is that it combines theory and practice. The curriculum design of our program involves both theoretical and practical aspects. And that can help students learn basic theoretical knowledge like research methods and also IR theories. Uh, while I also learn the empirical knowledge about Japan studies enabling students to understand how Japan actually works. And the second feature is that although this program focuses on aerial study of Japan, this program is supported by the College of International Affairs. Our students can choose course from Departmental Diplomacy, Graduate Institute of East Asian Studies, and Graduate Institute of Russian Study. This means that students can choose co course based on their interests and conduct comprehensive IR research, international politics research. And the third, the third feature is that it is an interdisciplinary program. So the program comprises four core fields, include Japanese politics and law, Japanese economy and society, Japanese history and culture, and Japanese diplomacy and security. The design of our curriculum aims to help students research on Japan study comprehensively from multiple angles, including analyzing from political, economic, social, societal, and diplomatic perspectives. Above all, the study on the reconciliation is highly relevant with the study on Japanese history, Japanese civil society, Japanese foreign policy. For example, I have a student who is working on a different Japanese social groups who have different interpretation of World War II memory and their position on the history textbooks. And I personally working on how transformation of identity might bring difficulty to the reconciliation on the history issue between Japan and, Jap and China. And I think many Chinese scholars and students are interested in this kind of study and hopefully more Taiwanese and scholars and students can participate in this, con this annual conference in the future. To conclude, I wish this conference a great success and I think I can learn a lot enormously from all the panels. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Weiting, for your introduction of Japan studies in your Chenzi University in Taiwan. And uh, in order to understand the Japanese nationalism, uh, the war imp impact of the war is very in indispensable. And also in the Japan studies, the core of Japan studies lies in the uh, how, how to evaluate the impact of, of war to the Japanese emotions. Thank you so much. The next presenter is Professor Taihei Okada. Uh, he is a member of our project of, of creation 
of reconciliation studies. And uh, he is a uh, associate uh, professor in University of Tokyo. He had gra he graduated from Northern Arizona University, and uh, he also graduated from Hitotsubashi University. He is a social historian, and uh, his field is uh, Southeast Asia. And he is particularly interested in, in the sexual violence in, in, war, in the war, war times. So he is a master of the historical uh, his, history of the history of violence in the in the Second World War. Oh, thank you so much. So it's your turn. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sano, and um, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. And I'm very happy to be part of this community. And well, I definitely belong to the University of Tokyo, but I have to history put a disclaimer because the University of Tokyo is just so huge. And uh, the section that I belong to is called area studies. And so is the Professor, um, Professor Kawakita. And Professor uh, Ishidatsi is also from the University of Tokyo, but he belongs to a different section called uh, Advanced Social and International Studies. So all in all, it's a huge organization. And what I'm going to tell you, it's just a small group that I know of uh, around me. And one group is something that Professor Asano just introduced. Uh, it's part of the JSPS fund. And uh, it's in English, it's usually called the Citizens Movement Group, headed by Professor Tonomura. And Professor Tonomura and I are both from the Area Studies Department. And uh, as uh, Professor Yo said, you know, the Japan-Korea relationship is definitely becoming an international issue. And it, in that sense, it's pretty dangerous. So it's imperative to try to understand what the other side is thinking. So in this light, uh, Professor Tonomura organized several lectures in the span of the past three years, some of them in association with uh, Center for Korean Studies. He invited several Korean scholars to talk about the Korean situation uh, over here uh, at Komaba. And uh, in addition to that, uh, he, he and I also interviewed about 25 activists. And now, especially his group is uh, sorting out the papers of Tanaka Hiroshi one of the four, forefront uh, activists uh, since the 1990s. And uh, also he, uh, Professor Tonomura hosted uh, uh, several conferences with the Japanese activists who have been in general very critical of the Japanese government. To put it simply, uh, especially in, in this section of our, of our activities, it is history from below. We are trying to collect diverse voices of activists of memory and um, I think collection of these voices itself is pretty significant. And the other group uh, that both Professor Tonomura and I are part of is called Global Studies Initiative, headed by uh, Professor Kawakita and also Professor Ishida Yuji. And it was uh, sort of organized by another center within Komaba called the uh, Center for German and European Studies, which you know, Professor Kawakita just introduced. And uh, they, have interested in, they have been interested in the issue of historical memories in Japan and Germany as well as, well as wider Europe for some time. And uh, some of them, uh, well, uh, let me skip here. And this group, well, and um, um, in this group, we are likewise dealing with the issue of historical memories, but perhaps beyond the framework of Asia, and I think it is comparative in nature. And some of the participants in this group are uh, Euro European scholars. Uh, like one is Professor Ogawa Hiroiki, and he's interested in British Empire and the issue of memory. And another scholar is dealing with Taiwan now. She's Akotomoko, and she's on comparison uh, on the use of dark memories in Taiwan and Japan. And, uh, but uh, one thing that became rather clear in the recent discussion within this group is that even the basic term like reconciliation has very different connotations between Europe and Asia. It is almost like we are comparing apples and oranges, even when we are talking about the issues of reconciliation in this globalized world. So I guess, you know, this kind of gap is pretty significant and um, it might be rather difficult to overcome. And other than these two, two different groups, uh, there are some other scholars who are interested in the issue of historical memories around me, especially the scholars on China, like Professor Kawashima Shin and Nakamura Motoya. And additionally, Professor Kimiya Tadashi is taking on the issue of historical memories between Japan and Korea as a straight jacket political scientist. 
And finally, as a Filipinist and the Southeast Asianist, from my perspective, this, this issue of historical memory in Japan has been too much focused in Europe and Northeast Asia. I want to bring in the perspective of global South, uh, especially Southeast Asia and uh, historical memories in the places like the Philippines, you know, to the table of discussion. And I'm definitely looking forward to all the subsequent presentations in this conference. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Asano. Thank you, Professor Okada. We have an informal, informal meeting after the formal session ended. So I recommend you to stay in these panels and have a conversation with Professor Martin or other, other scholars, even though they are European centered, but uh, uh, consciously, consciously we are focusing upon Middle East or African studies. Right. And thank you so much. And uh, redress from Japanese citizens is the main focus of the Panamura teams, uh, including Professor Okada. And uh, now we have finished introducing remarks of the liaison, liaison scholars. So we are going to the next, next, uh, next stage. Uh, we, have, uh, we have received a letter from some institutions in the world. So we have uh, two institutions. One is from Korea and the other from, from, from Germany. So I want to introduce uh, the Institute of Shalom Theology for South and North Korea in Presbyterian University and Theology, Theological Seminar in South Korea. Professor Pek Chun Hyun uh, is a representative of Put, put, can I call put? Uh, so please, uh, Pek Chun Hyun, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Asano, for introducing me to. And uh, I also especially grateful to uh, Professor Martin Liner, who introduced me to this conference. Uh, I have several times talked with him regarding some uh, theological or uh, study or project regarding reconciliation. And I'm very happy to be with you all, uh, all of you uh, at this time. Uh, I wanna share uh, my PPT to introduce ISSN to all of you. Uh, I'm um, Chung Hyun Baek. I'm a systematic theologian and also I'm a director of ISSN. ISSN means Institute of Shalom Theology for South and North Korea. Uh, as you, you might know very well, uh, we are, I'm located in the Korean Peninsula, right? And it is now divided in, uh, between North Korea and South Korea. Uh, my school, my seminary, uh, which is PUTS, Presbyterian University and Theological Seminary, was established in uh, 120 years ago, which is in 1901, uh, originally in Pyongyang, uh, in the North Korea area, right? But now it is located, currently located in Seoul, within South Korea. Uh, that's why uh, not only our seminary, but also all Koreans uh, very uh, great uh, hope and mind to be united, right? And this is uh, our school's uh, homepage, main uh, view. Uh, and uh, this is current uh, seminary picture. Now, our seminar is, uh, uh, which is uh, located in Seoul, uh, is uh, not huge, but there is a small seminary or university, but which is very strong focus on the theology. Even theology has uh, eight or nine specific uh, majors within theology. Uh, so this is one of the buildings, which is called Mission Hall. 
our center is located at this uh, right end, right end of this, the first floor of this building. Uh, let me introduce the, uh, explain uh, what we do, uh, who we are. Uh, the first one is a mission. Uh, we, we're gonna do comparing and analyzing the society culture of two Korea, so North Korea and South Korea, uh, which have differed during the Korean division, right? And discussing uh, ways to effectively witness the gospel to the North Korean people and studying and practicing mission work and service uh, for peaceful reunification of Korean Peninsula and for the promotion of peace in East Asia and the world. Our vision uh, is promoting Korean church activities for North Korea and North Korean people more vigorously and conducting uh, theological studies on peaceful reunification of two Koreas, thereby providing theological vision of the uh, peaceful reunification and helping North Korean refugees within South Korea and especially North Korean refugee students within our school and beyond. Providing training and education to the students and uh, further or Christians in Korea for peaceful reunification of two Koreas especially for mutual understanding between South Korea and North Korea. Uh, our, our main activities is like, uh, are like this, helping North Korean refugees within South Korea, especially North Korean refugee students within PUTS and beyond, right? So we are taking care of them by mentoring them through regular meetings or Bible study group, or we are, supporting them with scholarship and even living expenses. And we are assisting their own group activities, uh, camp or train conference, which is self-organized by themselves and connecting them to Korean churches and to presbyteries or general assembly of our denomination. This is one or a few pictures of those kind of activities. And another one is providing training education to students and uh, layer peoples, even pastors, right? Every year we hold a uh, school, like a conference, or uh, one year pro uh, process of uh, curriculum to the pastors or elders and lay, lay persons and lay person Christians, not only to students, but also all people outside our seminary, right? So every year, uh, more than 40. Sometimes we, we have, we had uh, all around 100 people for one year program, uh, uh, consisting, consisting of two semesters. It's like, uh, a graduate school. And what is most important is that uh, is conducting theological studies on peaceful reunification of two Koreas, thereby providing theological vision of the peaceful reunification. Uh, as I am, I am belong to the theological seminary, right? So uh, we are supposed to provide a theological vision for uh, reconciliation and reunification, right? So until now we have 14 or 15 theological studies on uh, reconciliation or reunification, uh, okay? Uh, and um, we have, uh, let me see, yeah. And we have we we made we made a Bible study textbook for uh, North Korean refugees who are in South Korea, uh, according to their understanding of South Korean uh, Korean language, or uh, accommodate their own understanding. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your listening. Uh, okay, thank you.
Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, how can I? Network, uh, thank you, Professor Chun Hyun Baek. So, theology network is very interesting, and uh, I expect a lot to for for your institute to join us and support and enhance the theology theology, theology studies network for reconciliation studies. Thank you. So, next presenter is uh, uh, Professor Phil Yat Musen Aldayani. He is a research director for peace and reconciliation studies in Middle East and North African regions. Uh, as Professor Okada says, Global South issue is a big issue in the reconciliation studies. Mm. He's a manager of the Middle East and North African regions uh, studies in Yena. Yena. And uh, he, he is a postdoctoral research, he had been a postdoctoral research fellow and uh, in the in the in the in the Yena University. And uh, he is a manager of Erasmus Plus project. Um, we was the university has also uh, another center of Erasmus project. So we are very happy to welcome Professor Phil Yadmusen as well. It's your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tiami and Professor Martin Leiner and uh, Professor Kralstina for inviting me and to speak of it. I don't know if uh, Professor Leiner is part of uh, the Armina as well. And if he likes to have the intro of Armina, I also can open for Professor Leiner if he likes as well. And uh, the, uh, what do you think, Professor? You want to give uh, an intro or should I give the intro? What do you think? I can say just something for the Armina, to the Academic Alliance for Reconciliation Studies in the Middle East and North Africa is uh, for the region Middle East and North Africa and with the people there. But it was built in Jena because of uh, uh, this was the only possibility to build it. And uh, I especially thank uh, Yad who, who made it happen finally. He was the one who made the contact, who spoke to the people, who uh, wrote also the proposals to receive uh, grants to get conferences funded and also a big Erasmus project we can now um, realize. And uh, I let the floor to you to, to present it. Thank you, Professor. You. Thank you, Professor. And we have, thank you. We have a saying, uh, Professor Martin is partner in crime. So this is how we start. So I will start like this and I will share with you my uh, PowerPoint. It's not PowerPoint, it's an interactive uh, session. I hope you can see it now. So I'll talk about the Armina. We have a momentum now. Forgive, never forget, for a better common future. So it comes between in the Arab world, as we say, normalization and reconciliation are, 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 are in a struggle today. So what is normalization and what is reconciliation? This is where Armina comes to, to, to let the Arab world understand that reconciliation is, is, not, uh, is not as normalization, forgive and forget, but forgive and never forget for a better common future. So this is our momentum. And I would like to start this by uh, giving you a brief introduction about what we are in the Armina. We started, the starting point for us was in 2015, Professor Leiner and I started writing emails and developing connections, MOUs with the universities in the Arab world. And we had so many universities that this said it's impossible. They will not work for reconciliation. It will not be very helpful for anyone. It will be like uh, you'll be normalized. You'll be a normalizer against the own societies in the Arab world. So we decided that it will not be in one conflict on one country, like let's say Israel, Palestine. No, it will be affecting all Arab countries, Jordan, uh, uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, Egypt, Libya, Tunis, Qatar, uh, Lebanon, Syria, all, all those uh, places around the world, it, uh, around the Arab world, it will be affected. This is our momentum. This is where we started. In 2018, we developed the first conference with the development of the DFG. So this was also uh, with the German Science Foundation. And then we did something called uh, reconciliation with refugees and we concentrated on reconciliation as a research. So the, the second part I showed the objective with you. 
Our objective is to develop research skills and capabilities on reconciliation and conflict transformation and peace studies. So this was our momentum in, in the higher education institutions. So we, we tackled the higher education institutions. Some professors did not want our professor to connect with the higher education institutions because they were worried about their own reputation that they will be you know, pointed as normalizers, pointed as people who work for conciliation is a, is a taboo. It's really taboo and they went to Professor Liner and told them, look, higher education institution, the Arab world will never work on reconciliation. Better to work only on, with professors. So we refused and we strengthened the cooperation with higher education institutions because this is where we realized that when you have universities, we have real impact on the students, on as Ledrich says, on the three levels. We will have the grassroots, we have the middle level, and we have the stakeholders. This is why we decided that the higher education institution is where we are networking, and the professors can come in and bring their higher education institution with them. So it will be, be, develop our triangle of reconciliation and peace studies and peace building. And, and the other thing of our uh, is promoting transdisciplinary approach in a multi-scientific scale. So we see reconciliation not as a part of theology itself, or as a part of social science. We see it as a multi-scientific scale. We have now in the Armenia students that are studying economic and political reconciliation. We have students that are studying, I myself, I'm an expert in IT. I study artificial intelligence in public policy for reconciliation processes. So this is by a momentum from Harvard. So Harvard today is studying this as well. And I came today to like, like two weeks with them in this kind of work. So we promote transdisciplinary research because we believe that reconciliation will develop what we call, what Ledrich says, a transformative action. So this is, this is here, I show you some of the life cycle of, uh, of Armenia. So we had the conference in 2018. We did it reconciliation with refugees because Germany had a full impact of refugees from all around the world. And instead of just one of my, sec my assistant told me at the time that nobody will come, I told her I will sit on the, on the podium, you will take a picture of me and will write that it happened. So I, I, about over 60 professors from the Arab world came, not just the pro professors themselves, presidents of about 14 Arab university came and we created something called the Armenia inauguration at the time. So it was a very successful meeting. And, and everyone was very happy to be part of it. And then in 2019, we developed something with the Palestinian Arab universities called Conflict Resolution and Reconciliation in the Palestinian Higher Education Institution. And the project is still working until today. So this also worked. And we are now publishing a book about the Armenia that happened in 2018, which is called Reconciliation with Refugees. In 2020, but we had another Armenia uh, conference where it was, you know, Corona and everyone said it's difficult to have it, difficult to be part of it. We were like uh, four people, I remember, or five, with Benjamin as well, he was there. We had over 107 professors who was in the conference and we had to use WebEx and very high system to accompany 107 online professors working together on this uh, conference. In 2021, which is this year, we started this uh, big, huge project with Erasmus Plus. The EU Commission decided that one of its, uh, you know, development principles and policies is to develop reconciliation in the Arab world. And they were convinced that this can happen only with education of higher education institutions. And we're working with Jordan, Algeria and Palestine. So this is like one a little bit about our life cycle and objectives. We can go here to show you a little bit about the Armina members. So Armina members, we have exactly about now 55 university members, not just professors. So here is some of the university. These are universities. The members about, about who registered 80 professor members from the Middle East and North Africa. And those are some of the university. As you see, we have uh, difference from different places, like from Qatar, from Jordan, uh, from Vienna as well. For, uh, JCRS is part of us as well. UNESCO Chair for Peace for Innsbruck. The Petra University, Arab American University, Tanta in Egypt, Notre Dame in Lebanon, San Joseph in Lebanon, Najah in Palestine, Istiklal in Palestine, uh, other Cambridge Muslim College, Fayyum Al Azhar in, in Gaza, which was really very hard uh, to get them in, but they want to do reconciliation. And I was astonished that the Gazans really want to do reconciliation, they want to work on it. We have here uh, Muhammad uh, Lam'i, the second Satif. Zaytuna is one of the old, it is the oldest Islamic university, and some people in Tunis call it, they are very radical, 
and they might be more like uh, ISIS, one of my uh, uh, Tunisian friends, but we went and met them. They were good people and they want to work for conciliation as they believe it is the right path to be taken. So this is part of what we are doing. Here, as you see, I show you what Armina is about. So Armina, what we do is we develop MOU and then we have a symposium, we do workshops, and then we do teaching programs. We have a summer school. We, we are now working on developing a curriculum for peace and master studies for higher education institutions in the Middle East and North Africa. And then we have a joint project research. We wrote a project with uh, Arab universities, not, it's called John Monet, developing European it's studies. Sorry to ask you, it's time, it's time. So yeah, I have only one thing. Great presentation. Plus, yeah, sorry. I have, this is our uh, uh, website. You can visit it and, and thank you so much for having me. And this is like, if anyone has any question, you can just come back to me and whenever you want. Thank you so much. Have a good day. And thank you for your prosperous uh, cooperation. I wish you the best. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Ardeani. Uh, Middle East and, and North African studies is a frontier field for reconciliation studies. So next presenter is Professor Martin Reina. He will introduce the Yena Center for Reconciliation Studies. Uh, he himself has founded this institute at the first stage. So, Professor Martin, please go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you uh, again. Um, I am just very briefly now presenting a bit the mother institution for, of the Amina. I think it's interesting for you because uh, the Amina and also a German speaking network we built up might ask to become a bit the nucleus of regional groups in these regions in the future. And uh, we could. Uh, join also with regional groups in East Asia in the association to, and just to know a bit about our, our center very briefly. I want to show you uh, my, the website of our center because here you can go and find also actual information and I want to be very brief. So the Jena Center we are announcing, you see here also the actual conference. We have this logo. Um, which is an artwork of an American artist. And uh, we were founded uh, in 2013 and um, have this approach with uh, um, the main points are that we want to work transdisciplinary, uh, globally comparative, uh, and with the idea that there is reconciliation in the middle of conflict, how it starts in the middle of conflict and transforms the conflict. Uh, this we call the Hölderlin perspective and the fourth main point of our approach is uh, that we also uh, always think that the symbolical effects of every act are important. Everything we are doing, even a, a merely organizational thing, uh, reflects some symbolic value and also maybe some ways of recognition or lack of recognition. So. We had, have here uh, our two doctoral programs. The one which is, is here presented is a, is a religion conflict reconciliation. Also with uh, Benjamin here, you see him on the screen. And, uh, and he, this is an older program, which is running worldwide. It uh, has 17 uh, students. Here's a picture of a, a project we had from DFG funded. Here's a newer project uh, led by Francesco Ferrari on the Martin Buber correspondence. Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher for dialogue who lived in Germany, was also an activist for reconciliation as well between Germany and Israel after the Second World War and between Jewish and Palestinians, um, people, uh, Israelis and uh, after the, he moved to Israel. So this is also interesting. And we have also our publication series, uh, Research in Peace and Reconciliation. Um, we have new work also about Paul Ricoeur with the database, a philosopher um, concerning questions of uh, memory. And uh, we have many professors in Jena, it's uh, 15 who are in the, the team and uh, postdocs and a lot of other 
other people and here are some pictures so i invite you to visit this website if you want to to stay connected and updated and if you want to know more there are also possibilities to be invited as a guest uh, professor or to to work a certain time with us of course you must always apply for for funding um, but uh, yeah, we un understand ourselves as a resource for everybody who wants to build up reconciliation studies. Thank you very much. Professor Martin, uh, Professor Lena, thank you so much. So next I'll very briefly introduce uh, my own institute, but uh, I cannot share my screen. Mm. I'm very sorry. Uh, so because my PC has just been set up, I must uh, change my, my switch. So I, I want to introduce my Institute of International uh, uh, Center for International Reconciliation Studies in Waseda. It has just been established in 2017, supported by scientific research money from Japanese Education Mini Ministry. And we have uh, five sections. And uh, one section is, is diplomat uh, diplomatic and political sections, which is analyzing the uh, normalizing, normalizing process with Asian countries. We are now, we are calling this process as a governmental uh, reconciliations. And uh, the, uh, the second section is about uh, Civilians, uh, civilians groups, those civilians who try to redress the normalized uh, claim works made by government uh, appeared in 1970s. And as Professor Tonomura is focusing upon their emotions or memories or their, their international, transnational networks and uh, how their networks has influenced South Korea's democratizations or how it is related to the Japanese uh, civil society, etc. Et the third part is a historian's network uh, headed by Professor Ryuchi. I'm very sorry to say he, he cannot uh, come today, uh, but uh, Historians have, have mobilized to the process of reconciliation in 1990s, just after the Cold War ended. And uh, in order to get, in order to commit Japan to the international uh, public domains, uh, like security, uh, how to build up the trust with Asian countries has become very big issues. Once Japanese government tried to face directly to the history issues and also mobilize the historians and uh, government uh, as a government uh, uh, organized joint history project, but it failed. How the his joint history project has been has, had failed is the main topic, and how the historians' ne network still survived. And the fourth branch is concerning. Is, is concerned about uh, media, media, uh, media's laws to build up the national memories. How wars or uh, colony had been memorized in each country's media, uh, such as film or movie or TV, TV dramas. And uh, media study is another field, but uh, in order to research the emotions or memory more uh, with more concrete framework. 
such a me uh, media studies branch is uh, indispensable. And the uh, fifth branch is uh, headed by Professor Umemori. Uh, and Professor Umemori is, a, is, a, is, a, is responsible for the uh, thought and uh, ideas toward reconciliations. Definition of reconciliation or methodology is strongly contested or sometimes uh, mis mis mistaken or mis misunderstood. So uh, how to arrange the concept of uh, reconciliation is, is uh, uh, Professor Memory's uh, uh, section's topic. And uh, we are now publishing a book of uh, book, the first book of uh, reconciliation studies in Japanese languages. I'm very uh, sorry to say it's Japanese, but we are going to translate the, the first Japanese book into English and Korean. And uh, I hope in the next year, uh, some book review special conference would be, would be held and uh, uh, we can communicate over the, over the contents of the, of the Japanese book, which has just been issued uh, ne next, next day. Ne uh, next, next week, we will we'll, we'll have a, uh, the new, new Japanese book will be, will be, will be published. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's time for, for us to, to end the opening sessions. Uh, thank you so much again for participating in these opening sessions and also participating in this IARS second annual conference. And we are now going, for, uh, going to the, uh, the next, uh, next panels. The panel one would be held today just uh, five minutes, five minutes later. And uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, the, this conference will continue. And uh, the detailed program of the conference is already uploaded on the website of uh, Waseda Center for Reconstruction Studies. So please check it. And we'll have a, we'll have a, have a break. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. So we'll start. 21.15, so we have a six minutes break. Thank you, thank you so much. So let's meet after six minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. May I introduce the meaning of the panel at the first times? And uh, the presentation should be headed by Professor Kawakita first, next to me. And the third is uh, Professor, not, not Professor Nam. Is it okay? And your discussion, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope that uh, everyone is uh, staying awake as uh, they either have their movie cha or their coffee or, or their milk and uh, they're enjoying how we're going to be moving now into the specifics of research. My name is Barack Kushner. I teach uh, East Asian history at the University of Cambridge, but I'm actually talking to you now from the lovely confines of Geneva, Switzerland. So it's very fitting in some ways that I'm talking to you uh, about reconciliation while sitting in the middle of Switzerland. We have uh, three speakers today for the panel on the historical origins of reconciliation in Asia. And I believe each panelist is going to be talking for about 20 to 30 minutes. Is that correct, Asano Sensei? I guess 20, 20 minutes. 20, 20 yeah. minutes. And then, which will allow time for uh, me and Professor uh, Korstalina uh, in the United States to offer some uh, discussion points and commentary. And then we will open it up to the larger uh, audience and panelists including on the Q&A. Um, so either feed me questions in the Q&A uh, during the talk and I'll try to then get to them after the talks or after the talks, you can raise your hand and um, we'll be able to call on you, perhaps some of the people and then the rest can send their uh, questions in through the chat. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the first speaker uh, for today, uh, Kawakita Sensei from Tokyo University who's going to be speaking on the repatriation of German people from Eastern Europe and reconcil reconciliation 
within Europe. So, uh, Professor Kalkita, the floor is yours. And uh, thank you very much for Professor Kishuna for your kind introduction. Uh, I, at first, I'd like to share the screen. Okay. So, um, in this panel entitled Historical Origin of Reconciliation in Asia, we are mainly going to talk about reconciliation in Asia. But before the two presentations by Professor Asano and Professor Nam that deal with the Asian case, I'd like to introduce a European case with special focus on Germany as one possible reference point for considering the Asian case. The topic that I'd like to focus on today is the first migration of German inhabitants in Eastern Europe immediately after World War II. Based on this example, I'd like to discuss war experiences and the formation of memories associated with that, which I think has a great significance for the emotion of the uh, general public and thus plays an important role in the reconciliation process in the following era. In Germany, this first migration of Germans is commonly known as the, as the expulsion. After Germany was militarily defeated in World War II, Poland and the Soviet Union ceded the Eastern U German territories and the Germans who had been living in the area, as well as German minorities throughout Eastern Europe were forced to migrate to post-war Germany. This population transfer with over 12 million people was one of the largest first migration in human history, second only to the exodus of forcibly displaced persons during the partition of India and Pakistan. This first migration of Germans cast a long shadow over post-war relations between Germany and Eastern European countries, especially Poland. I hope that the difficult post war relations and its overcoming between Germany and Poland would offer some interesting suggestions for the relations between Korea and Japan that will be focused in the following two papers. Germany and Japan have similar experiences in terms of loss of territories and population transfers after the defeat in World War II. The repatriation of Japanese people from various areas of Asia will be addressed in the paper by Professor Asano. Of course, there are differences between the repatriation of Japanese in Asia and the expulsion of German, uh, Germans in Europe. However, there is no doubt that these two cases are similar phenomena during the same period. These two historical events are also similar in that they are the victim experiences of the defeated countries of World War II. Speaking, of it, uh, speaking about experiences as victims, it's not always easy for a defeated country. It can sometimes cause problems inside and outside the country. And the formation of memories of those experiences could influence post-war international relations between former belligerent countries. The German case, shows how a unilateral historical view of the defeated country on their victim experiences has been changed through bilateral and interregional dialogue over time. My presentation considers the transformation of the understanding of history and the possibility of reconstruction among former Belgian countries by looking at the changing discourse on expulsion in Germany. To consider, uh, to consider German-Polish post-war relations, it is necessary first to review the experience of World War II. World War II began with the German invasion of Poland. Poland suffered under the severe occupation policy of National Socialist Germany. It is well known that Germans' war crimes were particularly severe on the Eastern Front. The genocide of Jews was the greatest crime of National Socialist Germany. 
all six extermination camps were located in Poland. The best known of these was Auschwitz-Wilkenau, but other camps also witnessed many victims. For example, in the process of Operation Leinheit, two million Polish Jews and 15,000 Roma uh, from the five large ghettos of occupied Poland were murdered in three extermination camps, Belgium, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Of the approximately six million Jews, Jewish victims in all European countries, Polish Jews suffered the greatest loss with 2.7 million victims. The leadership of Polish society was also murdered to prevent possible re resistance to occupation. Among the victims were university professors, officers, higher officials, doctors, landowners, and intellectuals. In total, approximately 20% of Poland's population was murdered. In addition, in areas which was incorporated into Germany after the invasion of Poland, Polish inhabitants were expelled or deported to Germany for forced labor. The memory of suffering is still strong in Poland. It is also important to look at the experiences of Germans related to World War II. In the post-war processing of World War II, it was decided to cede part of the Eastern territories of Poland to the Soviet Union. The cession of the Eastern part of Germany to Poland was also decided to make up for the loss of Polish territory. The new border between Germany and Poland was the Oder Neisse Line. Military defeats and border changes were accompanied by a massive displacement of Germans. After Germany's unconditional surrender, Germans and German minorities began to be expelled from various parts of Eastern Europe in retaliation for the occupation. At the Potsdam Conference, it was agreed that there would be a forced migration of German inhabitants who remained in Eastern German territories that would be ceded to Poland, the Soviet Union, and other Eastern European countries. The migration of Germans from Eastern Europe, especially in the Ari uh, stages, was accompanied by violence. Under harsh conditions with lumpen arbitrary killings, plunder, and sexual violence, 12 million Germans from all over Eastern Europe were forced to migrate to Germany. This process was called the Vertreibung, expulsion in Germany. This German term Vertreibung has a strong emotional implication. The word functions critically against those who put the forced migration into practice. This happens because the term Vertreibung refers semantically to the movement of cattle driven by humans in the middle. West Germany did not officially recognize the oder neisse line until after the unification of East and West Germany in 1990, as this had a significant impact on the understanding of history of the expulsion in West Germany. For example, in West Germany, immediately after the country's founding, the injustice of expulsion was emphasized to justify the demand for the return of the former German Eastern territories. Furthermore, violence in the process of the expulsion was interpreted as communist violence in the context of the Cold War. This image of violent expulsion was consciously reinforced in West Germany, which led to it being treated as a symbol of the war damage suffered by Germans. The sovereign was abused not only to emphasize the injustice of the border changes, but also to relativize the claims of the National Socialist regime. In Germany, the experience of suffering through expulsion could not be erased from the national memory of Germans. In the historical perception of World War II, a complex mixture of sufferings and public relations between Germany and Poland has had its significant impact on post-war bilateral relations. What efforts have been made to partial reconciliation between the two countries? And how 
has the discourse on expulsion changed? I will discuss this problem from two perspectives. First, I would like to discuss the role churches played in constructing the discourse of reconciliation. The Evangelical Church in Germany, a federation of 20 Lutheran Reformed and United Protestant Legional Churches in Germany, published a memorandum, The Situation of Expellees and the Relationship of German People to Their Eastern Neighbors, in October 1965. This booklet with six chapters was the most influential of all the memoranda issued by the Evangelical Church in Germany after World War II and has a symbolic meaning. <coughs> I'd like to introduce the contents of the memorandum in brief. Chapter one offers an overview of uh, the situation in Eastern Europe since the end of World War II. It deals with the collapse of Eastern Germany and the expulsion of Germans in the area and the uh, socialization of the Eastern European countries. In chapter two, the situation of the experience in West Germany is described. Sorry. In chapter three, the social system in Eastern Europe is described from a critical point of view. Based on these statements, chapter four points out that it is unproductive to adhere only to one's own position and discusses the danger such an attitude poses to peace. Furthermore, chapter five presents the stance that it is necessary to be aware that guilt lies on both sides and to take political action for reconciliation. Then in chapter six, German Christians are called upon to promote dialogue with neighboring Eastern European countries. The memorandum is one of the earliest voices in West Germany attempting to avoid viewing Germans as the only victims and thus attempt to deal with the expulsion in a calm and unemotional manner. The most important feature of the memorandum is that it presents the importance of reconciliation in rebuilding relations with Eastern European countries, which were former belligerent countries of World War II and belonged to the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. The memorandum of the Evangelical Church in Germany led to a heated debate in West Germany. How then did the Polish side react to the memorandum. In November 1965, the Catholic bishops of Poland sent an open letter to the Catholic bishops of Germany. This open letter was the first public statement in Poland stating that the forced migration of Germans after the end of World War II was unjustified. In the open letter, the Catholic bishops maintained their position that Poland needed the former Eastern territories of Germany as its own Western territories, while deferring to the expulsions and suffering of Germans and, and abroad, we forgive and we beg forgiveness. The open letter was hardly accepted in Poland at that time. This process, nevertheless, shows that in the late 1960s, the idea of reconciliation was presented by both the Catholic and the Evangelical churches in Germany and Poland and opened the way to the normalization of the German-Polish relations in the later period. Second, I want to mention the developments in Europe since the end of the Cold War. As mentioned, in West Germany, during the Cold War, it was common to talk about expulsion as a victim experience of Germans related to the war. However, after the Cold War and the unification of East and West Germany, when Germans wanted to talk about expulsion, how to think about the relationship between the suffering of expulsion on the one hand and the crimes of national socialism on the other hand arose anew. In this context, a fact came to attention in Germany in the 1990s during the National Socialist era. 
a policy of ethnic em immigration was implemented, bringing German inhabitants from Eastern Europe back to the German Empire. In return, other ethnic groups were expelled from the country. The genocide of Jews was executed as a result of this policy. Therefore, before they were expelled, Germans carried out the ethnic migration policy and radicalized it into an unprecedented genocide. This fact drew attention to connect the memory of the suffering and perpetration related to World War II consciously. In other words, it could be said that only by securing a diachronic perspective that included its history as a perpetrator did Germany acquire the conditions to talk about its own suffering. At the same time in Germany, attention was drawn to the synchronic context of the expulsion of Germans, which has been hardly drew any attention during the Cold War period. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, various population transfers took place in parallel in other Eastern European countries, including Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and Hungary. By paying attention to the many other cases of population transfer during the same period, one can avoid falling into a victim's perspective that considers only one's own country. It also helps to be aware that population transfers were not just the bilateral experiences of victims as perpetrators, ratios, but also a common experience for Europe as a region. In the first half of the 20th century, population transfers has been widely regarded as an effective way to solve ethnic problems. As a result, many population transfers took place in Europe during this period. These historical developments included the Greco-Turkish population change after World War II, the resettlement policy of the National Socialist Germany of uh, German minorities and Jewish people and another side of the coin, at the end, a series of population transfers in Eastern Europe after World War II, including the expulsion of Germans. During the Cold War, however, large-scale resettlement movements ceased. Then, since the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, and as a reaction to the shock of ethnic cleansing in the Yugoslav Wars, several studies emerged that were critical of the solution of ethnic problems through population changes or population transfers. This means that in light of human rights, the phenomenon of inhabitants being forced to leave their homes against their will came to be seen as unjustified violence. Compared to half a century ago, the idea of forcing people to migrate to create a homogeneous nation state is now evaluated completely differently and harshly criticized. In the historical narrative from diachronic and synchronic perspectives, we can see Germany's willingness to confront the past to build peaceful relations in Europe. At the same time, this view contributed to a critical re-examination of the entire historical process of population transfer in 20th century Europe. Before the enlargement of the European Union in 2004, Eastern European countries also shared the will to construct a common regional discourse on European history. In this context, the narrative was accepted, accepted and spread throughout Europe. The discourse on population transfer as a common regional experience from the diachronic and synchronic perspectives has a self-critical and integrative function in Europe. At the same time, the past is not the only consideration. During the so-called refugee crisis that has prevailed in Europe since uh, 2015, the experience of the successful integration of the expertise in even more difficult conditions immediately after the defeat has often been mentioned in Germany in arguments promoting the acceptance of refugee today. However, it is also true that narratives that cannot be reconciled with public sentiment will never be accepted and internalized. For example, in Germany, the narrative that condemns the National Socialist past is 
inextricably linked to the narrative that affirms post war Germany, which was created as a completely different state from National Socialist Germany. As for expulsion, a cabinet decision was taken in Germany in 2014 to establish a commemoration day of the expulsion. The expulsion is too great an experience to ignore. However, the date of this anniversary was set at June 20, World Refugee Day. The choice of this date was the best possible compromise to balance German ethnic victim feelings, uh, sorry, to compromise to balance German-centric uh, victim feelings with humanitarian empathy for uh, refugees in today's world. We can see that Germany is constructing its understanding of national history by carefully considering the experiences of both suffering and perspiration related to World War II. And I think uh, it is uh, already 20 minutes. And I'm very glad if after my per presentation about European case, we are now enough prepared to the next two papers related to Asian case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Kawakita. Did, did you have a, a, a one or two minute conclusion that you wanted to, to kind of squeeze in there before we end? Actually, uh, can I have uh, one or two minutes more time? Yes, one to two more minutes, go ahead, yeah. Thank you. Then uh, uh, I'd like to, um, <clears throat> as the final remarks, I'd like to um, and uh, have a brief comment. As Japan, uh, Japan experienced uh, significant suffering during World War II. The suffering due to the atom bombs reserves an important position in Japanese uh, understanding of national history. The repatriation of the Japanese also serves as a source of national memory for suffering during the war. In Japan, on the one hand, self-recognition as a victim of war formed the basis for strong pacifistic sentiment. On the other hand, it relativized the memory of being a perpetrator. Balancing such memories poses a significant problem in Japan. We need to think about how to form the discourse on Japan's war experience that can be accepted by the regional community of the Asian Pacific region and will guide us in the future while considering the memories of those who experienced it and the sentiment of the public. The European discourse that seeks an appropriate balance between national sentiment, bilateral reconciliation and regional symbiosis cannot be directly applied to the Asian, Asian Pacific region with a different historical and cultural context but I think would offer a suggestive reference point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we now seamlessly move to our next uh, speaker, and that is Professor Asano from Wasan University, who I think you all know because he's one of the founders of this conference, and he'll be talking about repatriation of Japanese from Asia and a view towards reconciliation with Asia. Professor Alisano, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, Professor Kawakita's last comment about uh, how we should reformulate national memory, balancing two memories as victims and uh, perpetrator is a very important point, even for my presentations. Uh, my preposition in this presentation is that any shape of reconciliation would be, is, uh, is regulated by a particularly historical context. The repatriation of Japanese and Koreans just after World War II ended was nothing but a great incident for two nations by which two national memories were severely imprinted. So in a different way, way and so in its own way, completely separated in Cold War age. It could be said that history is inclined to be explained in, in its own way, following national emotions and values each nation shares. And the Japanese have regarded Japanese repatriates as a part of war victims who were symbolized by the victims of the atomic bombing and air raids. 
while Koreans have regarded Japanese repatriates as agents of Japanese imperialism and exploitation, which should be taken away as quickly as possible. The main focus of Koreans lies in Korean returnees from North Korea, China, and Japan just after the war, and how they were related with the uh, uh, happening of the Korean War in 1950s. Though in the Cold War, war era, each national memory went on its own way. However, we are facing together, however, now we are facing together in this global age through internet communication tools as we are connected here in this association right now. National memories are always connected by some universal values. While the Japanese have selected a value of development and social welfare of the society as a first priority by regarding the war as a violation of social welfare or de development that should, have, should never be repeated, uh, symbolized by Oshin's dramas. Uh, Koreans, uh, after the process of democratization, have particularly selected a value of human dignity and freedom of individual as the most important value prior to the social development in general. For Koreans, the value of social welfare has uh, been regarded as nothing but which supported both the colonial rule and the authoritarian regimes before the democratization. In East Asia, with no mono, monotheistic mono, with no monotheistic traditions, it seems difficult to to manage such uh, such conflicts, either by our religious and universal values, or by whatever national moral it might be, because the issue lies in the factors that comprise the national morality itself. Universal values could be classified. Uh, classified uh, values or memories are part, are, are, are part of the factors which sustains national morality. Morality means uh, some kind of subjectivity uh, or uh, an, an identity. So the value or memory must be must be a target of analysis. Universal, um, universal values could be classified into two. One is values such as human rights, dignity of women and liberty that try to protect individuality against total value, against uh, the values as a society in the total. While another value makes much of social prosperity and the development as a, as a wall of a society. In the emotional conflict between inside the nations the, and between the nations, these universal values would be destined to be politicized by intertwining with appropriate national memory, as I mentioned above. It could be said in East Asia, national identity was built by sharing historical memory. Textbooks of national history have played a role in nurturing his natural identity and supporting political legitimacy. Emotional and national history is linking national identity and political legitimacy. By following the context of nation building, nation building and its function over human emotions, we'll be able to find any solutions more successfully through establishing a foundation or dialogue between different emotions following the tradition of East Asia, where shared history as a kind of public memory has functioned to make nations imaginable and emotional. In this context, combining or making some linkage between different national histories, which intertwined with its set of own values and explaining national, explaining national emotions would be given a special meaning. That's why I, I planned this panel. It could be called a kind of global history of emotion, values, and memory. Global history of emotion, value, and memory, which would be more important than appearing a history related case, history related case to any international courts. The key to handling history issues in any way seems to lie in how to create a global view to explain the origins of national emotion itself that are being attached to national memories 
as a tool to detach ourselves. Uh, global view should be a tool to detach ourselves from our own internalized emotions. In this panel, through the comparison of the cases of repatriation between Europe and Asia, focusing upon the influence of the human mobility of repatriation and evac evacuations, which took place at the end of the war, I hope the framework of comparison of human mobility and uh, resilient emotions attached to the forceful transfer of human life space as a war would help to historicize national emotions in which uh, each of us have been brought up we, through, through national applications. So how to reformulate uh, national emotions uh, is uh, intertwined with how to build up a global view towards a historical event. And, uh, I will show you the, some photo which was taken by US Army. In the same space, in the same territory, Japanese residents, colonial residents in Korea and uh, native Koreans did exist. But uh, in national histories, Japanese uh, so just Japanese repatriates in Busan or Incheon, and the Koreans' uh, national histories, uh, just the Koreans have been have been memorized. Uh, but uh, in reality, two two nations have been have been uh, have 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 existed there, and have closely communicated. This is a scene. The last governor general of Korea had signed a contract with the United States Army to, uh, to, to resign the practical sovereign, sovereign, uh, sovereignty to the United States armies. And the liberated Australian soldiers is laughing, um, catching, the, catching the head, the head, the, catching the heart. So, decolonization is a key word, but I, I, I don't have enough time to explain the concept. But uh, how empire's era should be memorized is uh, a big, big issue for the global, global, for the global, uh, global histories. The US Army has made very great statistics and great photos. So utilizing such a special documents, I'm now figuring, figuring how to make a global view which will combine the national history between Japan and, and Korea. It's a Japanese plan for Japanese repatriates from all over the Asia. One square box symbolizes 20, uh, 20,000 Japanese. So totally six, uh, six million Japanese must be repatriated from all over the Asia. So even from Ryukyu, Okinawa, uh, which was uh, supposed to be separated from mainland Japan, mainland Japanese should be repatriated from, from Ryukyu. Uh, and this is a photo of Japanese residents in Korea who is uh, going to be repatriated from, from Busan. Um, and the, the right side photo is uh, those Koreans who had just returned from Chinese continent. This is uh, dancer Che Seung and uh, Che Seung is a rabbi, uh, his, uh, an education minister. And uh, they are Korean residents in Japan which had been forcefully mobilized, sometimes forcefully mobilized, but safely returned to Korea after the war. And this, those Koreans' uh, picture was taken just in front of the Tiananmen Square. There are many, there, there are many Koreans in North China or, or Manchuria. They were also repatriated uh, by, by RO, ROC China and supported by US, US Army, Marshall Missions. And uh, this is a very unique picture uh, of, 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 of Pusan. So red line is uh, Japanese uh, people's, uh, 
people, pe people as assembled and derouding, derouding and the inauguration and the currency exchange and repatriated to Japan. And the Koreans welcomed by the same ships that uh, in the memory, national memories, uh, such a common space has never been de depicted. In the, in, the, in the Tiananmen Square, the uh, Korean provisional government's armies, uh, armies, uh, dead, dead soldiers, bones has, has been has been brought by another soldier's hand. And uh, yeah, in this way, I, I'm sorry, uh, it, it, I don't have enough time. As a kind of global history, how does the collapse of Japanese empire affect the course of post-war Japanese relation with its neighboring countries? Uh, I want to explain how how the Japanese Empire was deconstruct, uh, de deconstructed while focusing on strong emotions, both of the Japanese side and the Korean side, respectively, attached to lost human lives and uh, lost external property. Uh, such a mobility of human beings is closely connected with very strong, most strong emotions. So, in the process of the post-war, uh, in the process of the uh, national memory making process, such as strong emotions would be converted into the public memory, but the original strong emotions derived from such a, such a great mobility of, of human beings. After Japanese surrender, uh, 700,000 Japanese were repatriated from Korean Peninsula, and also 2 million Japanese from, from Manchuria. Very huge mobility. And also 900,000 Koreans from, from Manchuria and, 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 and North Korea. And also 100 uh, million, million and four, 1 million and 400,000 Koreans uh, were repatriated from, from mainland Japan. So uh, 13, 13 point, 13, 13 percent of total South Korean populations were repatriated Koreans from outside of the Korean Peninsula. And the 6 million Japanese uh, amounted about 8 percent of total population of Japanese in those days, 70 million populations. And uh, very strong emotions crushed, crushed each other. I want to show, uh, I want to show you the Korean strong emotion first. Uh, dating back to October 1945, a young male nationalist of, Korea, of, of, of Koreans, uh, Korean attacked Japanese uh, residents in, in, in Seoul in, in this way. Quote, Japanese people, you, uh, you are to entirely withdraw from South Korea by the end of October. You must attend to self-awareness as ruined people of imperialism. This ter territory belongs to the Republic of, of, of Korea. There are millions of war damaged com com compatriots and uh, paupers of South Korea by the, by the uh, uh, road side in temporary camps and under your you are eaves while wetting their sleeves and wearing locked clothes. How much longer are we are we to make them wonder in, in starvation? Uh, in, in this way, uh, Korean repatriates have no house to, to reside, but Japanese residents still reside in, in Seoul. So it was a, 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 a attacking from, from Korean side. On the other hand, Japanese repatriates had also strong emotions, particularly toward Japanese external property, private properties left in, in Korea. The professor uh, Yanaihara, who is very famous scholar as uh, anti-imperial uh, scholars, even Yanaihara uh, uh, said, uh, it says, quote, I cannot recognize the post-World War II international order to be essentially more progressive than that after World War I. The first reason comes from the fact that all Japanese residents in Asia were forced to, to evacuate to Japan proper after the war ended. 
Some of them might have been active Japanese imperialists who collaborated with Japanese militants, but quite a few of them had settled themselves with the private assets and had peacefully led their own lives with local indigenous peoples. Uh, they had had their own houses and real estate acquired by their own hands. So uh, private properties should be should be compensated by Japanese government or uh, counted by 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 the other other claims. It's a uh, I has claims. I'm sorry. So I'll skip. It. Uh, most uh, mm, in this way, the strong emotion derives from the huge mobility, and uh, yeah, and, and sorry. So I, I skip. In the, in the process of normalization process between Japan and Korea in 1960s, such a strong emotions uh, grew up in the diplomatic negotiations. Japanese government tried to argue at least private properties should be counted as Japanese formal claims, but Korean side, Korean government regarded Japanese private property as a part of public, public properties because public spheres had been monopolized by Japanese in colonial days. So the so-called private pro properties cannot be regarded as a part of uh, uh, Japanese, Japanese claims, it's a basic Korean, Korean claims. In short, the, in, uh, finally, uh, political, political offset framework had been made in 1965. Such a strong emotions of each side had been contained in the frame, diplomatic framework, frameworks. Japanese government would do unilateral economic cooperation program toward Korea, uh, but, uh, and uh, Korean government could regard Japanese uh, economic cooperation, cooperation money as a part of uh, compensation of Korean claims, but it, it's free for um, Korean government to regard so in, in Korean domestic context. But Japanese government said, uh, because Japanese government want to want to evade a responsibility to compensate private properties left in in Korea, uh, uh, in the political uh, in the political framework, all claims which derives from pre 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 war days would be null and void. And the Japanese government would unilaterally uh, uh, do economic cooperation program. Such a poli uh, uh, political offset of each claim have been the basic framework of the normalization in 1965, just until recently. The political offset composed both relinquishment of its claims of both sides, Koreans' claims toward forced labor or comfort women, also included from Japanese government point of view. In exchange for the Japanese government's relinquishing diplomatic protection over Japanese repatriate claims on external private properties and transferring Japanese civilian claims to the Korean jurisdiction, the Japanese government was admitted to evade whatever Korean claims that derived from forced labor or any unlawful activities under colonial rule. Typical Korean war claims uh, as, I, as I explained. Both the claims of Koreans and Japanese claims for external assets were considered to be settled in exchange for Japanese, Japan's aid for the economic development of Korea in 1965. Yet this framework is now legally regarded as unconstitutional in the Supreme Court of Korea, criticizing that Japan was evading its wartime responsibilities. However, now the framework needs to be complemented neither by the logics of international law nor by a unilateral sentence of a juridical court, but by the global history, which classifies the process of rebuilding two post-war nations the, and the development of national memory itself, and eventually nurturing sympathy uh, to each other. Uh, uh, sorry for, uh, 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 exceeding that times. 
So, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Asano Sensei. I don't think you went uh, it was only a minute or two over time, so we're keeping um, closely to our schedule. Thank you very much. I would remind uh, participants and uh, panelists that anybody has questions uh, as we're going through to make sure to put them into uh, the Q&A or the chat to me, and then we'll get to them when we get to uh, discussion. Our last speaker of today is Professor uh, Nam from Seoul National University on uh, the post-war in South Korea and post-war Japan. And I turn the floor over to you, uh, Professor Nam. You are still muted though, so. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, now we can, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Krishna, for your kind introduction and uh, inviting me. Uh, my, my topic is about uh, the, the, the evolution of nationalism in Korea and the legacy of Japanese colonial rule. And the, the original version of this paper has already been published in a journal in South Korea many years ago and has been developed and uh, presented at a conference uh, held in Korea uh, last year. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to present uh, this paper uh, and receive uh, responses from the scholars other than Korean. And uh, uh, I, like, I like to proceed my presentation uh, reading the underlined part of my paper. Uh, first, uh, I'll try to reconsider the discourse on nationalism in Korea. Uh, understanding Korean nationalism is uh, indispensable uh, for reconciliation between Korea and Japan. Uh, whenever there is a historical debate with Japan, there is a strong nationalist response to Japan in Korea. Uh, recently, uh, Lee Young-hoon, a renowned Korean researcher in economic uh, history and a history revisionist, uh, disparaged it uh, as uh, anti-Japanese tribalism. Since then, a new conflict between Korea and Japan has sparked. Uh, this proves that it is very important to analyze the impact of Japanese colonial rule in Korean nationalism. Uh, the, the, I think the discourse on nationalism in Korea has been trapped in a tautology uh, for a long time. Uh, hollow contents uh, of uh, uh, DNK, the discourse on nationalism in Korea, uh, results from the complexity and manifoldness of the discourse on nationalism itself. Uh, however, uh, the issue of nationalism began um, to be raised in Korea, in Joseon, uh, with the agenda of nation building at the end of the 19th century. Uh, since then, the most important keyword that influenced uh, Korean history in the first half of the, of the 20th century uh, was nationalism. Therefore, nationalism in Korea uh, emerged as a political principle uh, whose supreme task is uh, nation building and its practice. Meanwhile, uh, individual nation state, uh, which seek, uh, seeks survival, uh, aim, uh, aims to secure a basic uh, inseparable and indispensable elements domestic supreme authority and international sovereign equality. Uh, in response, uh, two elements uh, of uh, the Korean nationalist movements were uh, prepared in Korea during the formation of the original Korean nationalism in the late 19th century. Anti-feudal reform uh, internally and anti-invasion struggle externally were the basic elements of Korean nationalism. 
Uh, in practical sense, uh, nation states, domestic and international tasks can be converged on the slogan of modernization and self-reliance respectively. Therefore, if we define nationalism as a political principle and its practice for nation building, it is basically supposed to be a cyanic combination of uh, nationalism for modernization and nationalism for self-reliance. However, uh, the, the uh, aberration of Korea's case was that it has been evolved under the influence of an offset combination in which nationalism for modernization and nationalism for self-reliance could hardly create a synergy effect. Now, under these conditions, the legacy of uh, nationalism in Korea was formed. Uh, and the chapter two is the uh, most important part of my paper today. The, the independence of Joseon as a modern nation state was given by the, the Korea-Japan Korea Treaty of Amity uh, in nine, uh, 1876, but uh, it was self-reliance without modernization. The Article 1 of the Korea-Japan Treaty of Amity stated that Korea is a free nation enjoying the same sovereign rights as does Japan, stipulating that Joseon gained a status of an independent state in an international order of modern states. Although it donated, uh, de denoted uh, the, the denial of uh, Qing dynasty's uh, suzerainty over Korea, uh, that is the, the denial of uh, traditional order of Sade Kyorin. Uh, it, it also meant that Joseon was uh, incorporated into the, the order of modern international law in the, in the stage of imperialism, uh, in the sense that the Korea Japan Treaty of Amity was signed due to Joseon's surrender to Japanese coercive gunboat diplomacy. Due to this uh, ex ex exogenous uh, shock, modern nationalism emerged in Joseon with the contents uh, comprising nationalism for self-reliance and nationalism for modernization, respectively aiming to independence and national unity and development. Thus, uh, with the Korea-Japan Korea Treaty of Amity, uh, the, the task of nationalism in late Joseon period was to, full, to fill a free nation, uh, which was uh, formally given uh, with the, the contents of modernization. The reform movements uh, represented by Kap, uh, Kapshin Ku and Kabo or, or Peasant Revolution were efforts to change uh, self-reliance uh, without modernization for modern self-reliance and aimed to create a cyanic combination of uh, nationalism for self-reliance and nationalism for modernization. However, Qing and Japan's intervention in Kapshin Ku and Kabo or Peasant Revolution distorted the effort to make the cyanic uh, combination and the, the nationalism in late Joseon period was split into Enlightenment without anti-aggression and anti-aggression without enlightenment, revealing uh, essential flaws inside. Although the, 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 the establishment of a Korean empire can be regarded as a, an independent, uh, in, independent com completion of self-reliance without modernization, it was just a va variation on formal self-reliance. In the end, Korean Empire became Japan's colony and lost its autonomy since the Japan-Korea Treaty of 1905, and then uh, the, the Japan-Korea Annexation Treaty of 1910. Uh, thereafter, the, the process of colonial uh, modernization was no more than 
was no more than a modernization without self-reliance, no matter how much it contributed to bring about modernity to Korea. At this stage, uh, nationalism in Korea was uh, fragmented again. Consequently, conflict and uh, disconnection uh, emerged uh, between pro-Japan or anti-Japan, Chinil or Panil group who adhere to the modernization project and collaborator, collaborator with uh, Japan uh, or uh, residents against Japan. Buil or Hang Il group who considered a restoration of self reliance as the only task of their nation. Two groups aimed to secure modernization without self reliance and self reliance without modernization, respectively, and their goal was just a, a kind of a semi nationalism in that sense. Eventually, the, the experience uh, under Japanese colonial rule was the, the process of creating an offset combination of modernization for uh, nationalism for modernization and nationalism for reliance, self-reliance. And it has been a limitation of nationalism in Korea to date. Meanwhile, nationalism in Korea in, is in, in, inseparable from uh, Japan in that both the of national uh, modernization without self-reliance and self-reliance without modernization are always directly related to Japan. That is uh, in the, uh, independence from Japan and modernization by Japan have formed uh, an, an ill-fated dilemma of nationalism in Korea. The fact that since liberation nationalism in Korea was uh, predestined uh, to be divided into several kinds of discourse, pro-Japan or anti-Japan, and collaborator with Japan or resistance against Japan, reflects this historical situation. So uh, this uh, division of nationalism became the precondition of the development of nationalism in Korea and Korea-Japan relations since liberation, uh, liber liberation. Uh, the first, uh, under the uh, Ri Seungman regime, uh, nationalism for self-reliance became the mainstream of Korean nationalism and punishment versus backlash frame was uh, f uh, f formed. Nationalism in Korea under Ri regime was expressed as uh, self-reliance differ, uh, differing modernization. The, the, the liberation was given by the defeat of Japanese imperialism. But from Ri's perspective, the, the establishment of Re uh, Republic of Korea was something that Korean people achieved for themselves. Nevertheless, in fact, Korean people did not uh, win it from um, defeating Japan. Uh, initial goal of Ri's Japan policy was to make Japan confirm the fact that the Republic of Korea is an independent, autonomous nation, and Japan will establish an equal relationship with Japan. But the confirmation of equal uh, relationship did not necessarily mean that uh, Korea and Japan agreed to accept the normal bilateral ties. At the first Korea-Japan talks, Yoshida administration argued that if Korea were to claim compensation against Japan, then Japan would argue for a, a counterclaim against Korea too. This argument um, premised uh, that Korea and Japan became a normal bilateral relationship, not a victim uh, perpetrator relations anymore. In contrast, uh, Ri's uh, priority uh, was to confirm Korea-Japan relations is not a normal one, that is a victim-perpetrator relationship. It was uh, no wonder that uh, Ri is strongly reacted against Japan's uh, properly, a property claim uh, against Korea, 
and decided to, uh, to punish Japanese side. Anyway, Lee's punishment policy could not change Japan's attitude. Uh, although Lee he, he tried to make a frame of Japan's apology, Korea's forgiveness uh, before Korea-Japan talk, a structure of Korea's punishment for Japan versus uh, Japan's backlash was formed. That is, it, it was a frame of punishment versus backlash under the influence of nationalism for self-reliance. Uh, after the Ri Isingman regime was collapsed by the student movement uh, under uh, Changmyeon and Park Jong-hee regime, the nationalism for modernization become, became the mainstream uh, of Korean nationalism and an uh, overlook cooperation frame was formed and developed. Uh, in terms of Japan policy, a 419 system and that of 516 did not reveal any critical di difference. Changmyeon uh, regime uh, inaugurated August 23, 1960 and one of its urgent task was to normalize di di diplomatic relations with Japan. At the first policy speech, Prime Minister Chang pointed out that to resume the talks with Japan to restore the diplomatic relations, to do our best to offer economic and educational support for Koreans in Japan and to uh, attract capital from uh, Koreans in Japan to Korea are important part of our urgent tasks. In addition, uh, Chang regime uh, frequently mentioned the need to establish cooperation, cooperative economic system uh, of Korea and Japan. Uh, and the first five year economic development plan of Chang administration was made under the premise of a considerable amount of aid and loan from Japan. This policy line uh, suggested a shift from nationalism for self-reliance to nationalism for modernization by Japan. To this end, uh, Chang administration tried to uh, restore the policy line of modernization by Japan. So uh, under Chang regime, a frame uh, in which Korea overlooked Japan's past and Japan cooperated with the economic development of Korea began to emerge. Uh, that meant overlook cooperation frame under the influence of nationalism for modernization. Personal connections uh, between Korea and Japan with uh, which were formed since Chang regime were maintained even after uh, 516 coup, coup d'etat. And uh, after Park Jong-hee, Chun Doohan and Rotte Wu regime succeeded to Park Jong-hee's modernization is everything philosophy. Uh, Therefore, it can be said that overlooked cooperation frame under the influence of nationalism for modernization was basically uh, continued during uh, this period as well. And, uh, and Kim Young sam regime uh, revised the policy line of modernization by Japan, which had been pursued by previous regimes of, jun of junta. Uh, in Japan, non-LDP regime of uh, Hosokawa and Murayama tried to positively uh, respond to the Korean side uh, requirement uh, to settle the past and start over. At the same time, however, an opposing group uh, reflected backlash in Japan was formed in LDP. This was a variation of punishment uh, versus backlash frame under the, the influence of nationalism for self-reliance. So,
also uh, the limit of time. So I, I, I would like to uh, give some in, uh, concluding remarks. Uh, and they are about the, the remaining tasks of Korean nationalism and Korea-Japan relations. After liberation, nationalism in Korea uh, had to face its remaining tasks in the, in the limitation of offset combination of, of modernization and self-reliance, uh, which had been uh, stru uh, structured in the, in, the, in the process of uh, experiencing self-reliance with, without modernization and modernization without self-reliance. Under the influence of nationalism, suspending modernization for self-reliance during re-administration, Korea-Japan relations was unfolded uh, uh, in the frame of Korea's punishment for Japan and Japan's backlash. The time of ensuing regimes such as those of Chang and Park was the period of nationalism de uh, deferring self-reliance for modernization. And Korea obtained Japan's cooperation uh, as it overlooked Japan's past. This line of Japan policy uh, basically continued through uh, Chun and Roteu regime. However, under Kim Young sam administration, nationalism for self-reliance was on the rise and President Kim Young sams hardline policy toward Japan also reflected this trend. But again, uh, under Kim Dae-jung administration, uh, nationalism for modernization revi uh, revisited to overcome financial crisis uh, on one hand and to uh, modernize North Korea on the other hand. During uh, the Kim Dae-jung regime, the Korea-Japan relations was the best ever and enjoyed its honeymoon period. Nevertheless, the point is that all of those were half success and half failure as a strategy of uh, were practicing nationalism because nationalism in Korea has not been able to escape from the limitation of the offset combination of modernization and self-reliance so far. Self-reliance uh, and modernization are, are like two wheels fixed on an axis of nationalism. So nationalism can make a step forward and do something good for uh, their people only when the two will of self-reliance and modernization are spinning in the same direction. Otherwise, Korean nationalism just goes around in circles and cannot achieve any result. The nationalism in Korea has not able to get out of the trap of the latter. This problem has been reflected in Korea-Japan relations and consequently, the two have had no choice but to experience the ups and downs at times. Also, due to uh, this problem, still we, have, we may have and will discuss the issue of nationalism even when we are living in the era of postmodernism and uh, transborder. Uh, period, transporter age of uh, globalization. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nam, and thank you to all of uh, the speakers. Uh, if you would not mind unsharing your screen, Professor Nam, that way we'll be able to see um, all of the speakers a little more easily as we move into discussion. Is that possible? Professor Nam, could, could you unshare your screen, please? Ah. Thank you. That way we, we get our, yes, that's like slowly. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, now I will offer a few moments of uh, discussion, and then we will have a few moments from Professor Korsalina as well, and then we'll open it up from the floor. We already have uh, one kind of comment and question from Professor uh, Lehner in there. So we might be able to obviously uh, get to that as well. Um, thank you to all three speakers for handing in uh, their papers 
early so that uh, we could get a look at them in, in their fullness. Uh, and I'm going to try to offer a few comments, I think, that bring perhaps all three papers together in, uh, in a different sort of perspective, because it, it seemed to me that all three are in some way talking about ontological security, which is uh, a fairly popular theme to talk about lately in terms of how individual citizens' identity and feelings of domestic security are tied to historical interpretations. The idea of emotion that all three speakers have, have spoken about, and then perhaps uh, some of one difference that they didn't all mention, which are structural differences to the sort of international and bilateral relations that the countries find themselves in. And I think all of those elements have an influence on either the ability or what we're talking about here in some ways, the inability uh, to move toward reconciliation. Um, so, and this is also about control, control of the historical narrative, which all of the countries, even Germany, are interested in. It's a story of either victory, it's a story of defeat, and it's a story that some countries are happy if others control, uh, but most are not happy. And, and I would put Germany, even in that case, certainly West Germany, before it unified in 1990, was not so pleased with how East Germany controlled the situation. And of course, there's a legacy uh, that has moved into the 21st century with that as well. So on the level of emotion, I think what we're being offered here with all three papers is an interesting constellation of historical comments on the intersection of emotion and history. And some of this might uh, follow on what Todd Hall has been working on, on diplomacy and emotion at Oxford. So after reading the papers, uh, one of my first questions would be, how did Germany, and we might want to think of kind of Germany before 1990 and Germany after 1990, how does Germany um, manage to remove the emotional equation from its own historical analysis and approach its own war crimes with a more pragmatic stance? Um, was this due to a conscious choice or was it due more toward uh, due to geopolitical pressure from the surrounding countries and the fact that Germany after 1955 joins NATO? There's no parallel military security alliance in East Asia that wields the same sort of pressure on Japan that NATO pushed Germany to accept. In fact, one could say the opposite has happened in East Asia in that Japan has a single military alliance with the United States which has placed a different set of pressures on it. And similarly with South Korea, it has only a bilateral military alliance with the US, which keeps any pressure off of Japan to join in multilateral political uh, arrangements. Why is emotion still allowed to play such a significant role in South Korean politics domestically, but then also bilaterally with Japan? And it seems to me that this same process is not engaged in when South Korea is dealing with China or North Korea. So the opportunity costs, therefore, for any South Korean politician to deal more pragmatically toward Japan are lost, and the pressure is increased to engage to the extent possible in a very emotional type of relationship with Japan that would be more easily swayed by popular opinion. And so what is it about the legacy uh, that uh, Professor Nam is talking about? Are, in some ways, South Korean leaders until arguably the mid-1980s were essentially imperially educated. Did their collaborationist background, and I will put collaborationist in quotes here, um, does that push them to behave one way toward Japan because they need to demonstrate to domestic South Korean constituencies that they are very different from uh, the Japanese? Obviously, President Rhee in the immediate post-war was different, but in some ways, he too had to prove his worthiness after having been absent from South Korea for so many of the colonial decades. Um, another question that I was thinking about, and I was thinking about it actually as I was, I was reading uh, this book. Oh, it actually doesn't come up. I'm sorry. It's a new book called The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy. And it's a very interesting book about um, it's kind of going against the mainstream idea of how we think economies grow and what we base social values on. And I was thinking about this idea of value and social value that the speakers have all kind of mentioned. What, where are the political or social values in the history that's being constructed in Japan, in South Korea, and in Germany? What sort of values are these three countries trying to promote in the post-war? And how does that interact 
with a sort of historical narrative and paths toward reconciliation that we are presented with in these three papers. Uh, in my opinion, suffering and victimhood are experiences that are discussed in all three papers, but these are not values. And I think this perhaps maybe is a problem when we shift our focus from Europe to uh, East Asia. And in Europe, we talk about the principle of war crimes or the Nuremberg principles. But in East Asia, we only really kind of continue to think about what happened at the domestic level of victimhood or experience, but they're, they're never building anything greater than a collection, a collection of sovereign experiences within each country. Um, I'm gonna skip over here. So, um, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move to my last point after these questions, and which is um, in order to kind of move forward in this idea of reconciliation, do we need to move beyond law? I would argue in some ways that law perhaps, particularly in the Japanese and South Korean government relation, has become an impediment. Um, and it struck me in reading a book recently by the former Supreme Court Justice in uh, the UK, Jonathan Sumption, he makes an interesting set of comments recently where he talks about, quote, the empire of law. And in a nutshell, he reveals the stalemate that is currently occurring in East Asia, where international law is seen on one hand as a panacea to help resolve all political problems is also seen at the same time as the cause of those political problems. So one way forward perhaps is to abandon our over-reliance on international law as the way to solve uh, bilateral dilemmas and examine alternative strat strategies since the last seven years of relying on international law uh, for modes of reconciliation have not proved so successful in East Asia. Obviously, I have more comments uh, on these very interesting papers, but I just wanted to throw some ideas out there and I will cede the floor now to um, Professor Korstelina for uh, her comments as well. Thank you very much. And thank you, Barack. I really appreciate, uh, as an identity scholar, I really appreciate references to ontological security and identity issues. I completely agree. I want to bring one more, actually two more dimensions to this papers. I, I really enjoy the uh, listening to every paper and I believe they really work together very well. And one of the major questions which raised by this uh, panel, it's exactly about the, the very, very nature of reconciliation. Is it comparative? Can we do generalization in compare, while we're comparing multiple reconciliation processes and multiple regions? Or it's so unique and contextual, so we could not really make any common references and we have to go and uh, the, being a comparative conflict resolution person, I work in multiple regions and I hear very different perspective. And I really glad that this panel really want to bring different perspective to see underlying tendencies and at the same time stressing important contextual factors which impact every single process. And I think this is a really way to, to move forward in reconciliation studies where we concentrate on some common tendencies, common mechanisms, common processes, and at the same time showing how they perform in different contexts in different regions. Um, thank you for bringing this. My second uh, point, which is very important, I think what this panel brought is the role of power in uh, reconciliation processes. And our power, I'm speaking about power relations within each state and between every state. Let me be more specific because first of all, you bring this and Barack also showed this idea of victimhood, all three papers speaking about it. And Unfortunately, in many conflict resolution and reconciliation processes in identity-based conflicts, victimhood is perceived as a zero-sum game. And being a victim perceived as some, somebody to give people the power, moral power. So victimhood is used to not only impose moral power, but sometimes political power because we victims have a right. 
And what your papers are bringing on free papers showing that actually is not as simplistic and every side could be both victim and perpetrator. How we move to it, and this is what helping to reconciliation process, this acknowledgement, right? But how we move to this acknowledgement. And you really show very well that actually we have to move from monolithic perception of a nation to understanding of power structure within nation. Understanding how particular regimes, particular state, particular leadership work as entrepreneurs of memory, of emotions, and understand that responsibility of the nation doesn't mean responsibility of the state and vice versa. As soon as this, under, this is what really helped Germany, really, really distancing itself from Nazi regime condemning Nazi regime, understanding how Germany came into it, and distancing current nation of Germany from the power of that, right? So what happening in Asia, it's this distancing is more complicated because of the power struggles. Especially Professor Nam really showed very well how nationalism is important in Korea for internal power, of course, for ruling regime but also dealing with the fact that a lot of uh, Koreans who were in power, still in power, even like their uh, families, uh, collaborated with, Germany, with uh, Japan. Moreover, uh, the whole idea that Korea didn't achieve independence itself, it was US which gave independence, really shows this power struggle of Korea to really come into stronger relations with Japan. And this is perfect example for, uh, for example, the um, Takeshima Island, right? The Doctor Island. If you look into two museums in South Korea, huge five-store museum with 3D, 4D, uh, <laughs> like you, you go and you, like, you fly over the island. It's like a amusement park basically and then you look at the same museum in Tokyo it's just small room and it's very very hard to I, I had to struggle to find this museum asking multiple people to find where is it just to the power uh, represented power of this history represented within the nation is very very important um, collective emotions also because they in social psychologist and for me history is a belief so collective emotions play very important role in intergroup conflict but they also strongly connected to power because collective emotions give this power of rage and this power of rage very similar to victimhood gives this perception of um that we we're losing we're losing you a bit uh, analytic perception of emotion oh, oh sorry yeah you're kind of fading sorry. in and out moving yeah. from oh sorry it's what i cannot do anything so uh from moving from monolithic perception of emotions into more uh subgroups within the nation what we called more balanced collective axiology this is very important and um one more point is exactly the nationalism what uh, professor nam was telling is really increasing of, of uh homogenization of the nation it's nationalism impede reconciliation because it's prohibited what Tayomi was telling about how we can actually speak about multiple collective memories, multiple collective emotions, how we bring this reconciliation process into level of multiple groups and multiple positions. And very good also uh, idea of Professor um, Kawakita about the common identity, common regional identity. This is something which in common identity model in social psychology described as a very strong approach to reconciliation. I'm sorry that my internet was not good. I hope I get no, the just, point. Just a few so, moments here and yeah. there. So, yeah, so I, this is my major question. I really want you to uh, address the issues. How... Uh, no, 
you're, you're freezing again in each nation but also political power between japan and korea sorry uh, how you see the political power within the nation and political and powers even symbolic power right between the nation between japan and korea this at least coming in my research all the time the symbolic power uh, between japan and korea how they impact reconciliation process thank you very much Thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, we'll get you back. Uh, you you hung a couple times and you kind of froze uh, a bit here and there. But I think basically um, everyone could could get the message. There are two be before we have uh, our panelists respond a few moments each. Uh, there are two kind of questions that have come in on the chat. Uh, the first one, um, uh, just to kind of perhaps shorten it, is that. Um, the issue of thinking about refugees themselves um, linked to uh, reconciliation and re refugees can become important actors uh, for reconciliation, um, but they can also kind of become part, I think, as Professor Asano uh, was talking about, part of the non-reconciliation movement in a sense um, because of their memories of having been sort of cheated out after the defeat. And I'm wondering perhaps if either Kawakita Sensei or uh, Asano Sensei wants to comment on this comparison between the millions of German refugees and re residents and what happens to them in the reconciliation process. And then on the Japanese side, um, are there similarities or perhaps why are they so different uh, given that it's the allies in some ways that control the situation in both camps. Um, and then there's another question that came in from uh, Professor Togo. Hello, Professor Togo. Um, who, of course, uh, works on uh, these ideas all over East Asia and has written a large number of books on history and uh, negotiation and reconciliation. Uh, and his question is to Professor Nam. He says, uh, Asano Sensei makes a very interesting analysis. The lost right of Japanese, uh, those who repatriate uh, from Korea or from elsewhere to Japan, was practically lost in Japan after the 1965 null and void clause. Asano Sensei has brought this history back to have a wider view on, on reconciliation uh, from a more objective basis. Do you think, Professor Nama, in the long run, this approach might prove to be effective in Japan-Korea relations? So those are two uh, additional questions uh, that came in. Um, looking forward to having more from uh, the panel uh, from the audience and the panelists as we move forward. And I'm wondering perhaps if each of the speakers would like to give a few moments in responding to any of the comments or any of the questions that interest uh, them. And perhaps we'll take it in the same order. So I'll ask Professor Kawakita first, and then Professor Asana, and then uh, Professor, Professor Nam. So Professor Kawakita. Thank you very much. Uh, at first, I would like to thank you uh, to commentators, Professor Kshuna and Professor Prostelina, as for your suggestive comments. And I'd like to say some words to your comments. And I'm afraid that I could not react all the points referred, but I would like to select some important points like emotion, international consideration, and nationalism, and talk about them. So uh, to the first, question uh, from Professor Kshuna, how Germany could gain the critical way of approaching uh, its negative historical heritage? Um, what did it make possible? Um, it is a good question, but actually hard to answer. But I think uh, geopolitical factors have played a significant role. The, given the necessity of the political, economic, and uh, military West integration, there were no choice for West Germany but to keep a distance from its national socialist past. And in addition to that, uh, there were competi a competition between uh, West and East Germany. And here, uh, they had to prove uh, that uh, they were not only politically and economically, but also ethically superior to the other German state, as, which also promoted the critical approach to the national socialist past in both divided German states. As, in this consideration, the key values of West Germany were, I think, the democracy, 
anti antisemitism and West integration. And those of East Germany may be as anti fascism, anti imperialism, peace, and solidarity. Uh, those uh, values that uh, are that have been so strongly uh, determined by the Cold War and uh, the dividing situation uh, of two German states. In that sense, the attitude toward past may have been determined by pressures from outside, including international constellation, but may have been a spontaneous decision. And um, here I would like to um, uh, mention as a one point, and for, uh, when looking at the political culture in Germany still today, I have an impression that German politicians are reluctant to mobilize the national sentiments, especially on the matter of international rela uh, relations. We can call it maybe self-restriction based on historical experiences. As a recently, as a result lies of the new light-wing political movement like AFD as an alternative to Germany, the German's political landscape has been a little bit changed. But I think in comparison to other countries, for example, in East Asia or other former allied nations, self-restriction not to mobilize nationalist uh, sentiment and calls for uh, severity remains an important feature of German political culture, I think. And the other thing uh, I would like to uh, mention is the, yeah, the morality or ethical things. Yeah? Uh, at, um, the German way of solving international pro uh, problems arising from the past. Yeah? As one feature is that they don't talk about they don't necessarily talk about legal responsibility, but political and ethical responsibility. This is actually a clever way of settling problems. So for Germany, to take the responsibility is not its duty as, uh, as for political and ethical responsibility. So to take the responsibility is not, its, uh, not the duty of Germany. Germany doesn't have to take any measure if Germany takes some measure, then they can prove their willingness for reconciliation. As an observer from outside, I don't want to relativize the German will to reconciliation and their respect of moral value, but I can call it a good strategy. And maybe Japan is characterized by a lack of such a strategy, strat strategic way of thinking in the settlement of the historical problem. Thank you. Thank you. It strikes me just one interesting note of this competition between West Germany and East Germany at the time to make the West Germans in a sense look better internationally. And I guess that's perhaps another question we could ask of South Korea, North Korea is why is, I mean, there obviously was competition. South Korea has a peace treaty with Japan in 1965. North Korea doesn't. But aside from the establishment of that peace treaty, the same sort of competition between North and South Korea that we saw in East and West Germany doesn't seem to exist. And one might ask why that is again in the German case and why it wasn't in uh, the Korean case. Um, we're now, we, we have one, before we get to Asano Sensei, I just want to um, read out one more question because it might tie into what your remarks will be. And this came in on the, um, Q&A from an anonymous attendee, so thank you very much. The question is, it seems that nationalism promotes differences and collective negative emotion, emotion against one party, especially in the case of Japan-Korea relations. How can we minimize this nationalism without external shocks? Can national education or educational cooperation play an important role here? Uh, and that is, um, well, that's that uh, question. So with that also in mind, um, we now uh, would like to hear from uh, Professor Asana and his thoughts. Oh, thank you so much for your great suggestions. I'm thinking the, I must think about, about the questions deeply, but at least I can say, uh, I can say this way. Hey, my, my answer is, uh, is uh, is not enough. I'm very sorry, 
But the uh, first point from, from Professor Kishuna is about uh, pressure like NATO to, to post on Japan. Uh, the pressure did not exist uh, with, without the uh, United States pressured Japan and, and South Korea simultaneously to reconcile together, but politically, politically settled down some, some, somehow. But in the basic treaty of 1965, uh, the annexation treaty in 1910 have, uh, have just briefly mentioned and but uh, no no principle, no uh, uh, fruitful meaningful sentence has never been sentenced in 1965. So, as Professor Kushina expect, no principle at all in the framework of Japan post war Japanese normalization with Asian country. So maybe motivation was. Uh, fat tribe Japanese uh, politicians or diplomats in the, in, the, in the negotiation is about the economic revival of post-war Japan and how Japan could be could be back to international could be back to the international arena as a as a great power or even though not militarily but uh, eco economically that's why the uh, value which Japanese post or Japanese government uh, hold is uh, social welfare. I dare to say, I, I, I'm not sure because I'm not a philosopher, social welfare or development itself could be regarded as a kind of value, but I, I'm not sure. But uh, at least in, in, uh, practically, we can, we can, I, I can, I can say the um, uh, what kind of uh, uh, maybe like like China? China regards human rights as uh, eating eating enough in the in the in the stomach. <laughs> in the in that way, human rights or human dignity have been reinterpreted by Japanese uh, politicians as uh, social welfare. I always uh, remember the drama of uh, Oshin, 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 which is very famous in 1984 by NHK, broadcasted to, to all over the world, how Japanese people uh, suffered, suffered in the poverty, but uh, eventually succeed to modernize, modernize Japan. And through the deliberate uh, 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 through the diligent, diligent, diligent attitude and uh, diligent labors, uh, we Japanese had succeeded to be uh, back to international society as an uh, economic, economic power. That is a basic story of uh, post war Japanese society. The, in the relationships of, the, uh, of uh, South, South Korea, maybe economic security, what well, concept of economic security existed? So uh, ec uh, as an economic power, the Korean Peninsula's security is also important. So we, we must support South Korea. Uh, but uh, the motivation of supporting South Korea to security lies in the, uh, not, not, not comes from the principle, principle of dignity or freedom or, or something, but from uh, economic point of view or uh, power's point of view. And also uh, nation state itself or nations, uh, national society itself is very young. Nations have been newly formed through the modernizations. So how, how, can, how nation should be built up? It's, it is strongly contested even now, uh, even, if, uh, even in Japan and uh, much more so in, in Korea. So pro, uh, President Moon Jae-in's slogan is to rebuild Korea, Korea uh, rebuild Korea. Or uh, can we regard Korea as a, as a nation? It's a slogan of, of Moon Jae-in and uh, he tried to rebuild the nations uh, in order to build up the nations. The uh, universal value is important. Uh, Moon Jae-in's regime seems to, to 
evaluate the value of human dignity as a core value of the new nation of Korea. But Park chung hee or Lee Soon Man try to make much of the value of social welfare or greatness of Korea. That I, I guess it, it is related to the um, uh, social welfare as a nation or development as, as a nation. Uh, any, anyway, the youngest, youngest of nation state is closely related to the legitimacy, uh, which is intertwined with uh, emotion, emotions or emotional memories. Well, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Farina's uh, question, thank you, thank you. And uh, I, I, I have uh, the word of soft power is related to your comments. So how can we differentiate it to power, power relations from reconciliations? It's a very big question. Reconciliation seems very genuine and very pure, but uh, power game is very dirty or, or very uh, or cal uh, cal cal calculating, calculating everything based, based upon interest, a logic of interest. It's nothing, it's, uh, it, it is completely different from reconciliations, uh, I, I guess. But, uh, but uh, soft power is also very important to, to, to lead, lead contesting two nations into reconciliations. Such a multiple framework seems to be related to, the, to such a framework of, of power in which two nations has no no option but to reconcile uh, but to compromise at the first stage in the first stage they compromise following the logic of of power but uh, under the regime of, of compromise they start to communicate and start dialogues i hope the next step some something related to the uh, related to reconciliation would, would appear but uh, this kind of framework had, had already been realized since 1965. So Japanese foreign ministry have made much of human uh, exchange and cultural exchange in 1980s or 1990s. But uh, eventually, uh, citizens network or uh, redressing movement to citizens had to take a power and uh, is now accu accusing uh, such a governmental framework is uh, is not uh, is not just just a framework. So, uh, not simply separate emotional aspect from diplom diplom diplomacy, but uh, just facing to the emotional aspect uh, by mobilizing not only diplomats but uh, politicians, uh, uh, but, but scholars or media persons. And, uh, and uh, deciding the basic principles, how to exchange in the, uh, how to exchange is very, very important. And as for the uh, Professor Reina, Reina's comment, I want, uh, thank you. I, I, want to, I want to say nation building of post-war Japan was a very critical issue because of the discriminative social status of repatriates. They had been discriminated very severely so in order to process the rebuilding of, of the nation as ja post-war Japan, Japanese uh, civilians' memories related to his experience of the colony came to be victimized. And uh, Japanese repatriates originally as a, as a, as a, as a uh, originally spending very rich, rich, rich life in colony, but uh, they, after returned because of the uh, discrimination, they came to be regarded as a part of uh, victim peoples, like the atomic bombing victims. Uh, mentioning colonial responsibility of repatriates, repatriates is a, had been a taboo because they had suffered a lot when forcefully repatriated from the continent. Uh, in this way, why Japanese war memories are inclined to be uh, victimhood could, could be explained. Mm, nobody can, uh, those who mention uh, responsibility as perpetrator would be accused. Uh, then 
what did you what did you do in in the war were were uh, in, uh, the most important things is to revive Japan Japan again. So I I, I call uh, th this is a uh, Cold War era's uh, unilateral na unilaterally nurture, nurturing nurturing uh, national memories. But in in this global age, we must uh, uh, reformulate it, uh, uh, inspect our national memories, and we must uh, uh, research how national emotion it's, itself had been politically nurtured or had been uh, practically developed in, in the process of uh, not only diplomacy, but also domestic cultural, cultural policy uh, simultaneously in the, in the dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to Professor Nam, I, I know that it's uh, getting late, but I encourage everyone to stay with us uh, because of course, <clears throat> Professor Nam, you have the unenviable position of bringing it all together as the last commentator. But I think Professor Asano threw out a really interesting point there as well, not only about ontological security, about emotion, but another issue that's come out now is legitimacy and how many of these issues tie into legitimacy, particularly for post-war, newly, in a sense, independent countries, if we should define uh, Korea that way is also an interesting point. I know it 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 come it's a question that comes late. We might it might come out in discussion obviously tomorrow or the next day. But I thought it was just another point perhaps to highlight in our discussion. So uh, I give uh, Professor Nam. You have the last few minutes for your insights and responses. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot from the presentations of two. Uh, researchers and the comments uh, of two uh, uh, commentators. And uh, all of the questions are very difficult and complicated uh, ones. And uh, I'm very sorry <laughs> to uh, not have the, the ability to answer it right now. And it is beyond my English ability <laughs> to answer here uh, right here. So, um, uh, I would like to prepare an answer separately uh, and send it by email later, if it, uh, 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 if it is permitted. And uh, please deliver it uh, to the to panelists and the, the audiences. Thank you. I'm very Thank you sorry. very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, certainly it's, it's uh, sometimes <clears throat> difficult in different languages to think off the cuff and offer an immediate insight. And of course, we're all very aware that you work in, in several languages. So we will look forward uh, to your uh, more um, thoughtful response when you have the time uh, to write it uh, and respond. I, I don't see any more uh, questions that have come in on either the chat or the Q&A. I know we do have a few more uh, moments left, although it is getting late, but I, I think in the interest of, of time that I will turn the floor over to um, our host for this evening, who was in part uh, Asano-sensei. And Asano-sensei, Professor Gersten, would you like to add uh, final words of conclusion um, after this panel? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, it's enough. Thank, thank you so much. But we have uh, other sessions tomorrow. Tomorrow we have uh, three, three panels not only two, but also three. Uh, uh, so uh, let's sleep early today. Uh, but, uh, sorry, in, in East Asia, let's sleep today. But uh, we we are we are still have uh, five panels still available. But uh, today we can we can discuss the East Asian case as a model uh, in which. History is also important for reconciliations and mono, mono, without religious traditions, uh, East Asia context, history explanations, explanations in history is very important. And uh, European case should be a, a very important uh, uh, sign, sign mark. Even though the, the 
basic structure is very, very different, but uh, still we have, we have a lot of things to learn now. I, I do note, uh, Professor Asano, there was a question from uh, Professor Lerner in the Q&A, which says, uh, given the time and the length of today's meeting, would it be possible to hold the informal, uh, oh, I said, would, would the informal meeting be possible today, he's asking. Oh, yeah, 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 it's, it's true, true. I think people yeah, might yeah. have forgotten, forgotten yeah. about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, for uh, for for people in in in, in Asia, it's very tough. But uh, I know Europe in, in Europe or in United States, the, uh, it's it, it's it's uh, the day has already started, and uh, we will continue the informal informal meetings. So every audience should be should be elevated to panelists and those who want to have a informal communication with panelists or other audience. We welcome all of you to to have to have a have a such a to have an informal meeting. So, but uh, formally, formal 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 panels has just finished. Thank you, Barak Sensei. Hi, Martin. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I would like to continue to discuss on on this issue with refugees. Welcome, with... welcome, welcome, yeah. And, uh, yeah, this, this relocation of people, I completely agree. They, it's not just refugees, but they will internally displace people in the situation of Ukraine, right? And many other countries, like look yeah. what's going on in Caucasus right now. It's yeah, absolutely. Major, major issue, major mm. issue. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all the Balkans, everywhere we can, can see this. Yeah. And also Tayomi, while we're waiting, I, it, with power, I think it's also very important. I think this should be also part of maybe next conference because yes, there are like uh, coercive power, right? Power over and so on, but also there is a power sharing mechanisms and there are also mm -hmm. power through and power with like an rent conceptual idea mm -hmm. of power, yeah, power yeah. and concert. This is where mm -hmm. I think what reconciliation studies really miss is really bringing all these ideas uh, in uh, of um, yeah. positive, you, positive Karina, and your, constructive yeah. power. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I also think about the concept of power itself should be converted, uh, should be changed by, by reconciliation studies. Mm -hmm. The power's definition is very, very difficult. And uh, once we try to convince the power, the, we cannot measure the power. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you're right, but like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, mineral, minerals or wideness or uh, such a such a factor are mentioned, but uh, what, what power, uh, how much power do we have, do our nations have? It depends on the uh, real politics itself. So, but uh, yeah. How to, how to define the concept of power? It uh, must be re inspected. And also, what types of power people see, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, when I was in Washington, this research I was conducting, I found that depending how people see power, depending on four different conceptual ideas of power, they see the reconciliation with Korea in a completely different way. And it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think there is a concept that power is more to be able to do things together and there you need reconciliation and there is another concept of power which is more Max Weberian who says to impose your will against opposition this has not much to do with reconciliation and many people only think, think about this first type of power Absolutely, but we will also speak about power and persuasion, right? Then leadership lead through example, leadership lead through legitimacy, and it also can be used for reconciliation. I think as well as power description, it comes from capitalist world. So we should not leave the capitalist conception that we live today. So a little bit COVID-19, 19 and it will be changed this but uh, this conception we live uh, it's a little bit according to Nietzsche but uh, 
yeah so this the relation of power uh if i can be heard or or which uh, which instruments i have and uh, influence yeah a little bit uh, sophisticated <laughs> but So, for that, uh, Togo sensei, why, why, why not uh, appear? And uh, could you give us your comment, Togo sensei? Oh, I want to introduce uh, Professor Togo, who had been a Japanese diplomat and who worked for the relation between Japan and Russia for long times. And uh, very sorry to mention the Togo sensei's privacy. Togo sensei's grandfather had been a Japanese foreign minister who declared war to <laughs> against him. Yeah, it's, it's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So please uh, go ahead. Togo sensei, please give us your comment. Yeah, but, but, but I'm not, not quite focused on this issue of power and the reconciliation. So if uh, you're asking me this, this question now, can I? No, no, no. Not, not I, only, not only this, but also everything. Yeah. <laughs> About everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. General, general comments you you gave us in in the chat. Uh, ab about the chat, I I I already asked my question. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't have anything to add to this. But but I'm uh, just like last year. I'm fascinated to this gathering. And I'm particularly glad that uh, San Jose has taken this initiative, yeah. that in discussing the issue of reconciliation in East Asia, Tokyo is taking the first initiative. And San Jose has so uh, eloquently welcomed that uh, in four years time, the Koreans will take place, will organize it. Yeah, it's if, because the of the uh, yeah, many participants and Professor Martin, <laughs> yeah. Asia. Yeah. I <laughs> I really feel that there's small sort of uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel because the current Japan-Korean relations are so difficult. But this kind of uh, dialogue between Japan and Korea, particularly taken in this international context, I think uh, is very important and uh, we can learn a lot. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm af afraid that the Japanese people even the media is, is not yet well informed about this meeting, which there is an area, I think, as Anosai say, and others, and including myself, uh, can do. So that this kind of approach will have more, mm. more, more, more righteousness in the future, in, particularly in East Asia. That, that's my, my general comment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because of... Uh... Martin and uh, Karina and uh, Benjamin's collaborations, we, uh, I, even narrowly, narrowly could succeed to open the conference today. Thank you so much. And uh, Benjamin and Fan has worked very heavily <laughs> and uh, even if I pressure so much. Thank you, Benjamin. It's great pleasure to work with you. I meet, uh, I, I work with wonderful, smart people and uh, uh, with great inspiring, with you, Professor Asano, with Professor Leiner, that is my advisor, and, and Kristalina, Professor Kristalina, that is very, and uh, yeah, thank you for uh, the possibility to work with you. And Professor Abel Ghani is raising a hand, so. Do you have anything to say, Professor Abdelghani? Uh, hello. Uh, thank hello. you so much for uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, today and uh, the presentations and the, the comments and questions. Uh, it was uh, very informative. Uh, can I share something about power? Oh, I'm not uh, I'm not a professor. I'm, I'm a PhD uh, uh, candidate, no. by the way. Okay. Tomorrow, do you have uh, a, do you have a presentation? Is uh, uh, the, uh, after, after today is on the last day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On yeah. the last day. It's an informal meeting. <laughs> I I hope everybody stay stay silent and not so. Not okay, so yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, we'll be on the guide for Professor Karastirina. <laughs> I think in the panel. 
<laughs> May I take uh, now with the mic microphone because there is also uh, a reason for this uh, informal meeting uh, because we have uh, the International Association and we have uh, further steps to go with this association and I want a bit also to report what happened during the last uh, year briefly and also uh, a bit talk with you about next steps and maybe there are also some ideas from you how to proceed. So we had this first conference in Jena one year ago where we uh, made the foundation of the association and it was already affected by COVID so we could not invite people to Jena and uh, and then we, uh, what we made were some regional conferences, especially one uh, with colleagues from Ukraine about uh, Ukraine. Uh, also, it was Benjamin who organized a lot for it, also Karina. There were a lot of American colleagues. Toyomi stayed with us uh, until very late in the morning, <laughs> I remember, and it was very very good discussions and there was a huge interest in reconciliation from uh, places I uh, discovered that there are uh, colleagues who are studying reconciliation and uh, in, in Ukraine and some colleagues were also teaching in other universities in Eastern Europe and also across the world were present. So this was one beautiful event we had. Then we had some smaller events also somehow related to the association and uh, some questions, for example, uh, to prepare somehow to build regional groups. And uh, this would be my first question to this group. There could be, um, there is an idea to have regional groups. It was also a special wish from, uh, from East Asia to have maybe an Asian or East Asian regional group. Then there is also the idea to make maybe the Amina regional group uh, for the MENA region or uh, the German speaking network like would like to join uh, as such the association to be or have also more members from Germany and a kind of German uh, speaking group. It's not only Germans, also Austrian, Swiss and some Dutch people in it. Um, so, um, Maybe you report also a bit about what you think about and what is the actual situation with regional groups and other parts. What are your wishes, your projects, or how do you see this? So next year we have a near conference in North America by Karina. And uh, how about next next year? Maybe perhaps annual conference schedules should be decided not only one year ahead, but two years ahead, <laughs> if uh, we can uh, informally agree where or how the 2023 annual conference should be. Uh, maybe we can have uh, uh, big visions, how to bring up this IARS, Middle Eastern and North Africa, or Eastern Europe, or, or yeah, other than Western Europe. Because there are many participants now, just right now, from Middle East and Europe. I want to discuss such a long vision. It will be wonderful. I think we just need to find some. It's a big commitment, and uh, I think we st have start as soon as we will start getting membership fees and all of this. I think it will be easier mm. for people to know that they have payment for it, like they can hire students to do this and yeah. to help. Karina, the transferring money from the United States to Germany cost so much. I know, but with the United States, I think it will take the same as a margin, even more. Oh, yeah. Going through the, it's the through same the whole... in Japan. So I'm wondering. Uh, it will whether... take like a year, year and a half to register something international. Yeah. 
I wonder if we should make a local account in the United States or in Japan and gather the money. I don't know it. if, I don't know, maybe Martin should consult if it's possible to make under German law to have original accounts. Because if we start something mm -hmm. new, we have to go through the entire paperwork here and it's even mm -hmm. more, more painful mm -hmm. here with all, all tax laws and all of that. Yeah, I, I think, um, so I will, will ask whether this is possible, but I think there should be one or another solution to gather the um, membership fees uh, through bank accounts in different countries, and then maybe to transfer that them uh, together to um, a central bank account. And if it's, uh, we stay under German law and getting also German taxpayers uh, releases, uh, which might be also accepted in other countries, it would make sense to transfer the funds to, to the German bank account. If it's better for mm -hmm. the people who pay that the funds stay in the bank account in the US or in Japan or mm -hmm. another country, uh, I'm also fine. This is, we should find the best solution for the members to can be able to use uh, the best way possible for reconciliation studies, uh, uh, the membership fees, which anyhow are not very high, but there might be other donations coming and this might be interesting one day to have, uh, to think about where to have the bank accounts. I think uh, I have, I have uh, one thing that can be related to this. It's about the website according to the payment. Uh, because uh, our website is currently uh, developed on the Wix platform, uh, but it's free free website. So we can, when we can we can build accounts. So Wix it's a, it's a leading company in this field. Uh, so they also afford uh, they also can produce this platform. So um, as well, I think it's 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 good to combine things together because nowadays the registration process little bit. Uh, a little bit problematic because you need to send emails from the one side and after that. So it should be one uh, one website where you, each each partner, each, each uh, member can register himself and got uh, um, the email and everything online. Because I think this uh, old forms that should be signed is really uh, less fashion. Uh, and this, it's uh, in our online, uh, so it's also uh, people working with credit cards, and uh, we need to check this possibility with Wix, uh, how they exactly uh, functioning. So maybe uh, from what I understood, the platforms provide um, free payments. So so it's kind of it's kind of agreement. Um, yeah. But uh, we need to discuss about this uh, uh, form when we will get this first membership uh, 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 payment. So we can, uh, we can of course, uh, uh, it's a paying platform. Now we're using it for free, our website, uh, but the, uh, it's not a big amount of money. I think that you can see it, it on the website. Mm, there is also another platforms for websites that are less useful, less uh, friendly, what I have found. Maybe some other people, members knows it's useful. So yeah, I can provide this information about this uh, plan for a website. And yeah, and the second thing I, I wanted to ask about the promotion because as uh, I think, as uh, I don't see a uh, uh, professor, uh, professor Togo say about the media. And it's very important to, to come to the uh, media and to, to roll about, we talked about the power. So I come back to the capitalistic reality, maybe not capitalistic, but combined reality, that uh, it's better to come to some, uh, platform that we can gather more, not just uh, uh, members, just more attention, not for attention, but for uh, that uh, this, uh, this discussion will be seen. So maybe 
uh, we can make it because uh, our uh, influence, uh, your influence in academia, but uh, the other side of the media and uh, um, um, maybe mass public, it should be as well known as commented uh, Professor Togo. It's very important for my opinion, but yeah, it's up to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it would be worthwhile to um, to wait until Benjamin has consulted about the question how to use our website as a paying platform. And this might also avoid us uh, transfer, bank transfer costs, uh, which might be very high. So, um, and then we keep everybody informed who is uh, member or interested in the membership about how to transfer money to the bank account. Those who have already transferred some money, it's not lost, it's there are not many, but some send already some money. So it's, this will be, of course, be also kept and, uh, and used. And we hope to get uh, very soon now the, uh, the recognition as uh, for the common good working institution this is in Germany also not so easy to get. There are a lot of steps to do and to decide and what will happen if uh, the, um, the association will finish one day and all these things are not really a bit complicated, but in Corona times uh, even more, but we will get it through soon now. And then we will go ahead with this issue so that we can have regular membership fees and everything. And also, it would be good for preparation for the next conference. And this might be also my next topic. If nobody has something for this topic, this would be the next conference. Maybe, Karina, you might tell or ask who want to something for the next conference, or Benjamin first. Yeah, uh, I think it would. It's just regarding to the last question, not, not to the payments. In order to afford the website, we need some fees. So maybe we make it from Europe, we can take the fees. This the Europe banks is not a problem to transfer. But for America and, and Japan, and uh, for example, Middle East and other regions, where is this so high costs? So we can make it combine it. So we make some fees. We uh, in, in the case, we can make this, create this website. I think it's cost about 12 euro or 15 euro per month. It's not a big amount of money. That, uh, and we can, from this beginning, we can afford and thus we will have this platform that will, will combine all members. We will, the all members, it will be in one place because the, from what, I, what I'm seeing in the conference, we need one place as our Dropbox. So just the website, it's our place that you can enter, you can see the panels, the who is the participants, who is the members, and all this information together that we can send email from the website, because there is also a lot of possibilities that make uh, the work of the association more professional and uh, easier. Because uh, nowadays I'm half using this platform because uh, still we are using these personal emails and sometimes it's, it's a lot of mess. So about this uh, payment, so German institutes, we can pay, for example, GCRS, who is the members, or uh, we have this uh, conference in uh, November with the um, German Academic Alliance. So if they, inside, if they decide to join the, the, the IRS, so we can also to, to gather some kind of some amount. Yes, this is all. Thank you. And because Professor Nam is still, still in, the, in, uh, in this place, um, and I, because Nam, Professor Nam mentioned four years later, he might, uh, uh, he might be an administ administrator for supporting the, another uh, conference in, in Asia. So Professor Nam, do you have any technical programs to to think about the issue of accepting 
the annual conference in, in, in South Korea. So he seems to, to not, not correct it. But I personally uh, talked with Professor Nam whether he could accept the annual conference four years later. But before, before that, we must settle down Bank account and the website and uh, the conference order. Maybe we have another informal meeting in the, in the third days after everything finished. So today we, we, we should gather all technical or very fundamental problems and let's think about until the third day. And uh, if Martin or anybody have some idea, please, uh, please uh, um, present. In the, in the last day. I'm sorry, it's uh, 12, it's uh, almost midnight. <laughs> so I, I go to sleep first, I'm very sorry. Can I, can I do so? So, so we should have a second uh, short informal meeting as I, I propose also to talk about the Washington conference and also about the scientific board Oh, not yes, long time, to... just a short mm -hmm. one. Maybe tomorrow we can ask whether people are still fresh enough mm -hmm. to have this. And uh, I understand you are yeah, really scientific work is very important. Worked I... hard today. You gave your speech and everything. Yeah, tomorrow so, my time yeah. is uh, one one o'clock a.m. So tomorrow it's free better. sessions. Yeah, tomorrow yeah. it's free sessions. Yeah. Yeah. So it will be even harder. Today is much better than tomorrow. It will be harder. <laughs> So you must sleep very deep and yeah. good. Yeah, it, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I think, Martin, with scientific session, we really have to send all participants, maybe ask them to um, submit if they have interest to be a member of scientific committee. We can have uh, two processes. One, self-nomination, where people nominate themselves and write like, um, one page why they want to be and how they contribute, or we can do nomination by members of ERS for scientific committee, and then we can have a meeting where we select uh, members of scientific committee for some period. What do you think? Like, just because we could not, like, I don't believe in the Zoom meetings, they are not productive in terms of really important decisions. No. So I think we just need to extend this self-nomination nomination process until probably, I don't know, October, November, and mm -hmm. have a meeting and have decision. It's very yeah. important. I would not rush with that. No, no, I, I also do not want to, to rush. And I think we, I just wanted to ask his question in general, yeah. what people yeah. are thinking about it. And uh, what maybe the tomorrow in the morning. Yeah. Have, maybe but, uh, yeah. Maybe tomorrow in the morning you can make announcement for like in the first during the first maybe in the beginning of each session we have to have a short announcement. Maybe mm -hmm. even if uh, Benjamin can make like one slide, just slide like this is what we looking for. We want to form a scientific board. Please do nominations of nominations and send it to Benjamin or something. Yeah. Yeah, but what is the uh, I try to understand uh, um, the reason, and I think this also will be good maybe in the end of the conference to make it, because after all... A lot all... of people will not participate in the last okay, session. Okay, so maybe... I would do it. I think people will be selective which session hmm. they go. So if we can do it in the beginning of each session, just quick announcement. But what's the, what's the main goal of this uh, board will be? about the journal mm -hmm. martin has us like even like mm -hmm. a like have a position within the our law yeah, right it's, a, it. it's, a, it's a chapter in our statute and they have an important role to play so either the addition of the conference is normally their task and as well uh, the journal as a peer-reviewed journal and uh, also to provide some uh, uh, digital ma materials uh, on reconciliation 
and we also could think about uh, giving something to uh, um, teaching classes like master programs on reconciliation, like a kind of certificate that it's uh, acknowledged by the International Association for Reconciliation Studies. And this would also be a task of the scientific board. So it's a very uh, prestigious uh, task as well. And we can support some programs or we could also tell people you call this reconciliation, but there is no reconciliation inside or <laughs> not enough or something like this. Uh, this um, would also be their task. So it's an important uh, group. There should be 30% younger scholars and up to um, something like eight persons should be on this board. I think we can have a choose between five and 10. And, uh, and this would be for a certain time, they would uh, work on this. And this, I think, is an interesting position, but also a position where people must be committed and like the work and have time to engage in it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we can may maybe we can build a couple of papers because I, I when you speak, when you talk about it, uh, I thought about this conference, upcoming conference of a German association because we have there uh, very, very um, strong scholars and very also as well uh, uh, students that they have uh, more uh, uh, students from leading universities. So I think they will be also interested from the uh, from what I understood from the vibe uh, uh, of this. So I think we maybe build some call of papers for example, it's up to you. I'm not so. For example, a, a couple of positions that we looking for for the association. It's one, two, three, four, and we define the the wide line, the local wide line for what is it young researcher, what is it not young researcher, and they sent us their CV and and uh, etc. And we can choose because uh, uh, this way, uh, I think it uh, uh, will be more professional that we can uh, do that. But we can, we should start to promote that from tomorrow. Uh, I mean that we should promote that and will say that nowadays conference is getting bigger and it's uh, uh, um, established a journal and we should uh, should repeat it. Uh, every every day, just another format, and we will have this uh, uh, open uh, open uh, um, uh, uh, positions, and people can submit. But I also think that also not only these uh, researchers, but also uh, um, the these uh, activists or uh, academic who are retired already. But uh, uh, they have the influence and, uh, and influence that can be part of this. Probably I will not sure I'm not sure that we will have this time to do those tasks because we understand that some kind of some kind of task that related to to uh, technical. So it will be more related to young researcher that uh, that yes. But also the researchers who have a, a gross, a big experience. So we can build some, for example, three profiles uh, and spread them after that. After we finish the conference, we promote it. And after that, we publish it on the website and we take emails and we spread this call for, for researchers or committee. And then we will wait for resumes for, for people that that we'll like and we can make an interview, not interview, just formal job interview, but the, the expectation and everything. And this panel can be built separately, just independently. This is, will be also great because it can be functioned independently. And after that, uh, the relation to the, uh, to the um, uh, president, vice president uh, and uh, secretary, it's, it's also the connection because to separate some kind of tasks in other way, we will 
go deep inside that and it's uh, to feel to uh, to feel uh, <laughs> so much emails that we have i saw that i think is pro <laughs> professor asano you are in the middle <laughs> middle of night and you saw all these emails you just open and you see 50 emails and you don't know what's going on yeah. i see yes but so i think it will be more professional way but it's up to you it's more built in and to to begin to promote it from tomorrow for example i can i can do a little a little speech at the beginning that the uh, that we decided uh, that the, the, uh, the association is is going bigger and we're looking for to establish according to german law uh, the scientific uh, um, scientific board that will include leading members as well, and we also can invite people that have this the name on these positions that can be uh, these the senior members. Um, yeah, and the others, so we can we can combine it together and send an email in the end. And I'm repeating myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay yes yeah, so, so it's a twice third time i will not repeat <laughs> so okay so the, again this uh, this um, promotion and every day this not same message but with different with different uh, poker face so, <laughs> so it will not heal just like as a, a verb from coca-cola yes i'm joking so what do you think? Hey, Karina, you want to, to say something or? Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to say that like, for example, uh, I, I think it's too much to protect. I mean, we probably need to think about but I mean, it's very, very important issue about young participants. And uh, maybe we need to get feedback from them. Like we can identify group of participants who were at this conference. We have oh, your PhD students, my PhD students and others. And we can then ask them feedback and what they want ERs, how they think ERs can help them. Maybe get like some uh, questionnaire for the, sent to them, like two free questions. How they see it, did it help them? How they see their future, what can be done? What, how they see their role? And again, I don't want to rush this conference, but I think this is where we're starting. And this is a process long, long time ahead. And it should be more interactive and more sharing power. <laughs> Speaking about power in this yeah. way. Um, and for the conference, for example, in the United States, um, my university does not have money, does not provide conference money. So we will need to work together in, in the full to apply for several grants and like for National Endowment for Humanities, some other places I will look for. Maybe it's time to do postdoc and uh, international association. <laughs> So it's good to combine to combine productive <laughs> and and something that uh, <laughs> that's full time job that's pro, pro <laughs> so I have this idea but yeah I mean the hours of Toyomi <laughs> beside the hours here beside the hours here in Germany is not uh, yeah. Yeah, money it's money and hour. organization is a very big issue very tough issue. But uh, excellency as a scholar or as a postdoctor student is another thing. So double capability, uh, mm -hmm. not only academic capability, but also such, such administrative capability, two, two aspects is indispensable. But uh, in the worst case, those who are capable of administrative administrating money or organization is good, but <laughs> academic capability is a little uh, dubi dubious. I guess it, it, it's 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 wrong it's wrong wrong case. So how to select a, a pro proper um, proper person is a big issue. In Japanese uh, uh, academic society, such such things always happens. 
So how to select young brilliant scholar is very very tough issue. Is is the situation same in Germany or in the United States? Yeah, it's a difficult issue, and I think we can agree with what uh, Karina said, also with what Benjamin said, that we should take time and uh, start a process. And I think maybe as a conclusion that we that I announced that we want to set up this board and what is the functions. Maybe at the moment, you to Yomi find good that you give me the word tomorrow that I announce this, maybe in the beginning or in the middle of the day, and I say it again in another moment. Uh, and then we, we start the process and uh, uh, try to identify the people who are the best people for the scientific board. I think this would be the why way- not, to uh, Why not, Why not, would be responsible for announcement of scientific <laughs> If you want yeah. to, I mean, you can say it as well. I have a no, lot of no books here. <laughs> yes, I, I, can, I can do good promotional stuff. I was Thank working you. <laughs> for Thank a you long very much. time. Yes. Too much, too much yeah. time. Yeah. Thank was, you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. So I'll Thank quit. quit. Uh, I'll quit. Yeah. So, good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Yeah. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. All the best. See you tomorrow. Good night. See you tomorrow.